Let's see if this works. This is for, there's some students that couldn't be here tonight that are in the cast. One of them is getting on a plane at six o'clock for her honeymoon. And there's another one that is, they're, they're working. We actually have work, working actors that couldn't be here. So, so guys, for those of you asking Neil questions, you know, don't, don't ask anything that you wouldn't want your fellow students to hear you asking. And do, do ask Neil the questions that you think the fellow students that can't be here, that want to be here, would ask. Ask those kinds of questions. Is that, that's fair. Okay. Um, all right. So, hi, Neil. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to your life in virtual reality. Very, yeah, very nice. It's very and, nice. And it's you have so a cool. lovely backdrop. That's great. It's a, yeah, this is, um, you know, just putting together some furniture. There's a, there's a cat. There's a feline that is a total show-stealing showstopper. So Fantastic. Might Love come it. In, might come into the picture. Um, Don't worry. So, but thank you for, you know, making it to your computer and pressing the buttons and, and getting My here tonight. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. You're in New York City at the moment? Uh, no, I'm upstate. Actually, I'm in... Uh, in Dutchess County, like an hour and a half out of the city. Lovely. Yeah. Has, nice. has, um, has spring sprung where you are? It's right on the cusp. It's right just, on the cusp. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's been a hard winter and uh, it's um, warmer, but it's, it's, you know, every day threatens a little last hurrah of snow. A little last hurrah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I get that. Nice. So right on the brink. My sister's calling. She's She's a doctor. I'm sure everything's okay. Okay, so um, I'm all right, sure. great. I'm sure well, it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, so I'm so it's just this is thrilling and just you know off the bat, thank you good for to see you. being with us. It's so good to see you. We thank have you. literally you know the last year and more and more um, we have been able to continue to grow and thrive and have creative dreams. Thank, come thank true. God, not easy. Yes, and it's because of you in, in major part. <laughs> Thank so, God. And like, like, no kidding. There's, um, you know, what you provide for actors to take on. Um, see, we discovered, we discovered in this pandemic, the secret to happiness. Which, which is? It's progress. Okay. That's yeah. Fair. We discovered yeah. that inside of our classes that people were uplifted spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, and in large part due to the fact that you dared, you had the audacity to write plays, which, you know, dig up humanity of a certain kind. And so it really, you know, your work and your words have truly been life-saving and life-giving. And we're, we are so Un we're grateful beyond words. I'm trying to put words to it, but I hope you, you get put, the idea. Put a few words to it. For, <laughs> for not having any words, you put a few words to it. That's good. <laughs> right, right. Not bad for not having any words. Not bad at all. Um, now I'm I'm not great at this, but I'm. Yeah. Is there a way to? If I put this on gallery for me, am I? Yeah, I'm going to see everybody. Yeah. So can you see? Yeah. Are you able or, to like or, scroll or through? most everybody? I yes. think I get this. Yeah. Okay, so you you can scroll through. So let's. You know what, Eric. Okay unmute everybody ask everyone to unmute and everyone just say hello to neil abute just unmute everybody and just say hello and just chaos for like hello. 10 seconds go go very nice sound thank you <laughs> all right and you're out okay good um you know uh so and so great and you're going to talk to everyone later you know the fun thing about hosting a zoom or co-hosting with eric gustavo is that you you have you get to say no, where, where is eric I'm, eric uh, gustavo wave there's eric. Hello, okay eric. Oh, all i have to do is can to read like i can do yeah okay. like just try you know it's a thing the names aren't constantly up there actually it's, it's so it's if you if you hover your arrow hmm. over people's do you know what i mean I like do you okay. see, and it kind of should bring up a name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 now they're kind of all, all there, now that I've said something. Yeah. Yes, magic. Just like, a, just like a car that has a problem, and then when you take it to the mechanic, <laughs> Perfect. there's no problem. There's yeah, no problem. Now, now everybody's name is there. Okay, I'm good. I love it. Fabulous. So, um, so yeah, so this is the quorum. These are students, past, present, future um, of the school. We are, as I mentioned to you, you know, we've been... Um, to the mat, um, to the depths, working on your all, you know, 
I, I got, I just, I got, I don't, I don't, we have, we have them all here. It's just all, all your stuff you're, and all your yeah, place. And too. we're going to be, <laughs> we're going to be um, working, you know, doing the showcase of uh, the break of noon and the showcase later in the summer of, in a dark, dark house. And then people and students are working on all other kinds of scenes from all other kinds of your plays. And Great. so, um, uh, and, but since I'm unmuted and this is a Q and a, I, I think I'm going to, I get, to, I get to start for now. Fire away. <laughs> I, I think, do I get to start with my questions? Because I'm unmuted. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, but I don't have any questions. So <laughs> you're going to have to get this going. I have no, with my questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, and then, and then uh, we'll open the floor, so to speak, so to speak. So, and, and so guys, just to give you, you know, a little bit of context, um, so Neil and I, we met decades and decades ago. I'm a total dinosaur. There was a West Coast premiere of The Shape of Things, and um, and that's when I um, I first engaged with Neil and and um, got to got to know him. And and Neil, I just have to say this before we begin anything, because this is an acting school and acting students in class. Uh, some of the greatest acting lessons of my life actually came. Um, through sort of interaction with you and your work very early on in my moving to Los Angeles right after school. And I thought I would just share that with you and the group um, um, inside of, yeah, like some of the best acting lessons that I got were, you know, through you and with your material. One of them was um, when I was auditioning for The Shape of Things. And so, I actually went to an open call for that. You know, they have like agent calls and fancy sure. calls. And then they have like open calls. Uh, you don't have an agent, whatever, whatever. You just yeah. show up, right? And right. so um, I, I saw the open call and I had read the play a ton, a ton, a ton. And I thought I am going to bring in Evelyn. You guys know the shape of things, two men, two women. And um, I thought I am, I am going to... Ev Evelyn, Ev I want to audition with the role of Evelyn in The Shape of Things. And so, so Neil, I like learned the whole part and like learned all her speeches, like, you know, all of her monologues at the end. Like, sure. I was, like there's a couple. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like completely, like I showed up like dressed as like, like Evelyn. <laughs> and, uh, you know, cause we had, I had some, we a month maybe before I knew, you know, that the audition was happening. So I went to town and I'd read the whole play m multiple times, but really was prepared to give it my all, Evelyn. And I walk into the room and it's Andrew Barnacle, who's the artistic director of the theater of the Playhouse. And I walk in, he said, great, what are you gonna do for us today? And I said, you know, I prepared a speech, an Evelyn's speech. And he looks at me and he goes, really? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what? And he's like, comforting. Yeah. I know. So I said, he's like, uh, he said, you know, yeah, we can let you read some of that, but you know, outside on the table in the, in the office, we have some, we have some sides for Jenny, the other female character. I think, I think it'd be really great if you just, you know, you took a look at that and read that. I think that'd be, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to me later on afterwards, read some Evelyn, but good. You know, look at those other sides. So, so now, well, <laughs> finish the story, but now I have a question for you yes. as just an actor, since we're just going back and forth and talking about my stuff and yes. acting and all that kind of stuff. I, I see where this is leading because I know I know the end of the end of this story in terms of you know how we met. Yes. In your in your career thus far, have you had many experiences where you've walked in imagining you're going to audition for something and they say, "Can I have you read to go out and learn something else?" You know, in the in the, in the ten minutes we're going to give you. And, and come back in and be somebody entirely different? I absolutely have, but never as profoundly as this situation with your play. Okay, okay. <laughs> I have asked people, to, I've asked people to do yes. the same thing and, and yes. on, the other, on the other side of the table. And I've wondered, am I doing them a favor? Because, you know, to me, they seem like they're, they're more this other character that I have in mind, or are they just looking at me going, you fucker, for, you know, <laughs> ruining my, I had this little perfect bubble and, You've now kind of told me that you don't think of me in that way. And I have to now just off the cuff, come up with this new read on this character. So I, yeah. 
it's, it's is it somewhere it's, in between? Is it is it terrible and great or? It's terrible and great. And one of the, my the fa- my favorite movies that I ever booked was exactly that. They did. They actually mm. asked me to prepare about twenty pages of this film. Twenty and then, pages. Yeah. And then when I got in there, they said, "Actually, we want to see the opening," which I hadn't really, you know, gone through as thoroughly, not nearly. And I did. I did book that movie. Good. You should. I mean, you did the movie, frankly, for them. They should have paid <laughs> I you there did the whole movie. For the audition. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I did the whole movie. And Jesus. so, yeah. And so it has happened. And but what I learned, Neil, when it happened in the context of your play in that particular audition, um, I learned what acting is inside of particular techniques that need to be applied in moments like those. And I also learned what it is to be an actor, which is to say, it's great that I really saw myself as Evelyn. Like, it's great that I could really see myself in that role and was really feeling so excited about it. And to tell your story to the maximum effect and to serve, you know, what you wrote and what you wanted to talk about, it, it would work that I was Jenny. It just would, it would just work better to get the story told. And, and I really, in that moment, at least in, that, was, at least in that production, I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's the, the, the problem. You've got a text and then you've got someone who's going to interpret that text. You want to get through that, you know, barrier to do your interpretation, but you know, you've got someone there for better or worse, who's the, you know, the, the captain of that ship or whatever analogy you want to use. And um, th- they're going to have some take on that, you know, and, and uh, whatever's on the page, they, at this point, you know, kind of have the reins to that. I've given the rights over and they've made their decisions. So yeah. they're seeing you through a certain lens that you either say, no, thanks, or great, I'll give it a shot or, or whatever. But it, yeah. it is hard to spin that dial and go in the few minutes I've got now. Because some people, you know, some people are, you know, they turn on a light switch and they act and then they walk off stage and they're, <laughs> they can go talk to people and they come back on and they're, yeah. you know, and other people have to have a long time getting into that place that, that works for them. And, and there's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's just what works for you. But yeah. I think sometimes that that can really throw a person to say, it can. "Oh, hey," <laughs> and I've always thought, "Oh, that's a you know, it's a great thing to like not just make someone walk away and go, oh, be nice to them, but really in my head they're not that person." But if you see them and you go, "Yeah, you know what? You should read this." Yeah, I always thought that was positive, but I guess in some ways for some people that could be could be a negative thing as well. I mean, nobody wants to book a job, but you also want to do good work yeah. and work that you can do. Yes. And I do think it's positive. I think it's all positive because I ended up, they they called me two weeks later and offered me the part of Jenny. So it was absolutely positive and positive inside of, it was going to, for that time and just in terms of the casting situation and yes, through their lens, it was just really going to work to fulfill upon that role, that part inside of your story. You know, it really was, it was going to work best. And, And the other piece of that, that's why we go to acting class. That's when acting technique comes into play when you need it. And it's moments like those, no kidding. You know, we're working on Friday in a technique class, these things we call first reads. And it's literally, it's designed for moments like those, which do happen surprisingly often, you know, you'd be, I mean, it's, they do happen qu- quite a bit um, at every level of the game, you know, in front yeah. of the network, in front of the producers or in front sure. of you know, free read for casting. Sure. It really tends to happen. So yeah. And it's such a reading yeah. is such a different skill than acting. You know, I yeah. guess people think you think it's all a part of it, but every, the, the world is broken into such different pieces, you know, and I've yeah. met so many actors, good actors um, who are not necessarily good readers, you know, just, Yes, probably in, in life in general as as readers, but but it doesn't translate in, into like and now with so much, you know, Zoom readings and shit like that. There are people that I think twice about calling for that who I would cast in a second, you know, mm-hmm. because reading is a particular skill. It's a great skill to work on. Absolutely. You know, it's the same thing. I've never seen a school. I've never seen a class. I've never seen anyone teach continuity mm-hmm. on TV and film. Yeah. And that I have seen more good shit, you know, good performances <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, be compromised, be tampered with, cut down, cut out, because people don't 
have a full understanding or haven't practiced the art of, and I say art of, because I think it is an art of, you know, knowing what your hands are doing, what you're eating, you know, how many times you've smoked that cigarette. Yeah. I've caught myself uh, many times in in the spot where you're like, fuck, why is her hands (laughs) on that glass now? Why did she suddenly in this take the very best take, hold that wine glass when she wasn't doing that before. So I'm going to have to just cut back to the other person until she puts that wine glass down. And she is now, whoever this she is, she is losing screen time because I've just got, you know, I'm constantly showing the audience where to look, you know, on on a stage. I mean, it's, it's the same in film, but because of the close up, the way in which we choose to, you know, frame a, a shot, your face may be the only thing filling that frame. And, you know, and you've got that hovering wine glass and I'm like, where the fuck did that come from? <laughs> so every other part of this take is great. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to use that take and I'm going to just cut away from her and, you know, sh- stay on her husband until she puts that thing down. Yeah. And then boom, you know, it's, you know, it's, you've lost all this good stuff because nobody ever taught you to, Yes, you're saying the lines. Yes, you're emotionally there. But you seem to have forgotten that you're at a table. And why are you now eating the bread when you were never <laughs> eating the bread before? Yeah. It's, you know, but I've never seen anyone give a class on, on that kind of thing. It's a total missing. It's a total missing. And really, the presence of that would make such a difference in time. And I don't know why I got on. That. I guess the idea of there's so many skills that go into making up People just think, oh, you're an actor, and that's just an all-encompassing, you do everything that goes with acting. But, you know, what job do you know every part of until you've really, really worked on it? Absolutely. And truly, in technique class, we prepare ourselves. Oh, actually, I used to shovel barns. I used to shovel cow shit out of barns. That I learned really easily, very quickly. Everything. Mastery. Everything there was to learn about that job, I had down in about... 45 seconds. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of repetition, but all the <laughs> skills, I had all the skills very early. Well, that's, so. the, that's the trick. Those two words. It's the repetition. Other than, other than, those, yeah. other than that job, yeah. most other jobs have, you know, requirements. So It's true. And it's why we go to class and keep training because it is true. Repetition is the mother of skill, period, yeah. end of story. Whether Sorry, we only had time for one question tonight, but, you know. <laughs> We kind of oh, no, covered I, everything in one question. Um, that there, I don't even think uh, there's a question yet. I already, we yeah, are, we're, I still, we're still in the context of, of how we met. We're creating a context, but this is good because uh, right. no, this is this is more than all our dreams coming true. Just this part, but um, but that uh, yeah, that we do we do um, develop ourselves. It is a cra- It is it is it is so crafty, crafty. I guess, yeah, that's why people you know. do talk about it that way. And you yeah. Know, when and I it, think about the work I do, I think of it, I tend to think because I, maybe because I come from a, a blue collar background, I tend to think of it as work, you know, yeah. it's like kind of roll yeah. up your sleeves, get sweaty work. Yeah. Different than the, you know, working in the, in the barn yeah. was, but um, <laughs> sometimes I, I do. Th- yeah. Sometimes I do think of it as, as like, you know, there's a lot of, of work there, perspiration, you know, and yeah. inspiration, all those, those, you know, recipes that they talk about, but yeah. um, also coming from, from people, from a family who, you know, most uh, really uh, on the male side anyway, didn't really consider what I did at work. You know, it was sort of like you do that little thing that you do. Uh-huh. I guess you don't want to get your hands dirty. So you're going to, what you're going to type and, yeah. you know, never considering it work. And so therefore, you know, in my mind, it was like, well, I'll show you, you know, I'll work hard and do whatever I do. But um, it's always seemed like work to me. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we talk about if you're not sweating by the end of rehearsal, it wasn't a real rehearsal. <laughs> we talk in those terms. We say that. that. Well, you, know, you can always turn up the air conditioner, I suppose. Right, we could. You know, I did. I put, that to a, put that to a, a halt. <laughs> so that's so great. Okay. So, well, the second, the second major uh, lesson that I, I, I gained in our, in knowing you um, was a few years after the shape of things, um, 
you, uh, it was Fat Pig and, um, and Carrie Russell had done the role of Jeannie in mm. New York. By mm-hmm. the way, Carrie Russell and I have the same exact birthday, born on the same day and the same time. I don't know about the same year. And she and I both have very naturally curly, curly hair. You remember I have very curly hair. Uh, I remember. So yes. does Carrie Russell, by the way. Yeah. Anyway, yes. that's neither here nor there and may or may not come into play. But you were casting it on the West Coast and uh, at, the, at the Geffen. And mm-hmm. I was coming into uh, for that audition. And um, this was so illuminating. So um, this was also, I think this must have been some sort of, maybe not an open call, but another kind of call where there had been an appointment made. Um, and I was so, you know, th- thrilling to be anytime working in your world and in your words. It doesn't matter if it's an audition or we're doing the play or whatever. It's just, a, it's a joy and a pleasure and excitement. And I get, you know, I, um, I'm on fire to do it, whatever it is. Um, but I walked into the theater where they were holding auditions. Yeah. And you were there. <laughs> you were there. I'm- at your audition as thrilling yes sure why not yeah and i that uh, up to that point because even with the shape of things you were remote and you did some final casting on the shape of things but you know for the west coast but up to that point you know it 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 had never happened that the writer himself i mean that you know was there you know there for it and I went into like a wonderful septic shock around it and I did the audition and, and what I, what I was present to during and after was, gosh, I really wish I had had more time or I created more time to just really get so flat on every piece of punctuation, word, dash, syllable, so that, you know, in front of the writer, I could, you know, deliver it as it was meant to be told, um, pristinely. And, and I, I walked away from that and I was like, yeah, what a great lesson. And what it taught me, Neil, is that, and what it ended up being, it ended up learning that lesson with you. Like, I wish I had known it better. Like, I wish I just had the language, like, like I know my own name, you know, I just wish I had Mm -hmm. the language like that. I got that in that audition with you and I took that away and I decided that whatever I was going in for, I was going to learn it like I knew my own name. And you know what? It turned out that when I started auditioning then for television and film and episodic, guess what? The writers are in the room for that too. And they wanted to hear their language delivered, enunciated, and articulated exactly as it was designed. Not not really paraphrased? They they didn't want to be paraphrased? Oh, on these procedural shows? No. (laughs) Oh, no. No. Oh, no. It's funny how I've I've heard a lot of paraphrasing. And I'm not very, you know, I'm not particularly precious about that sort of thing. You know, if somebody has a better idea or it it sounds better another way, it's great to try it. But it's... It is weird, I think, to to um, to approach it. You know, that's that's that shot that you have, yeah, uh, moment where hopefully they've looked up from their iPhone and and you yeah. know and their, and their lunch and uh, are going to give you that time. You know, and yeah. they're, they're sort of most people don't like to waste their time. They're yeah. there. They're hoping you surprise them and, and they go, oh, shit, we got to cast this person. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that is there's, you know, that door is open for a, a moment there and, yes. and to not walk through and be able to like look them in the eye. But I've got to like hold those pages in my hand or glance back to those or, you know, not give them the best foot forward is a it's a risk. You know, it's always a risk, it but it's, it makes it a lot riskier, I think, for you as a as a person to to walk away with that, that, uh, that part, if yeah. you're not, you know, taking your, your best shot at it. Totally. And I so got that from the experience there at the Geffen. And I tell you, did, I, did, I did, they say, did, did someone say there's a couple of pages for Helen out there that you should go take a look at. And I wish they had, I wish they no, had, I would have done it. I would have done it. I would have done it in a heartbeat. Of course you would have done it. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, that would have been a dream come true. Uh, there's still time. <laughs> there's, plenty, there's always time 
That's, until, until there, there isn't. Until there isn't. Yeah, right. okay. I mean, that's, I guess that's, that's the game we play. There's it always time the until there isn't. That's yeah. the game of life uh, and living. So, um, but I really, really, I want, I, I ended up booking all of these like NCIS. So I really owe you residuals on all of the uh, commission because Feel just, free to just pass getting, that just getting that, just g delivering their language, like exactly how they dreamed it up and wanted to hear it was made a difference, you know? And so yeah. I'll send you some, you know, Please. Commissions. Okay. A couple of checks for 27 cents would be, would be happily cashed. 27 cents. You said a 27 cent. Check. Yeah. Some, some, sometimes those checks are amazing. They, they cost more to send than they're <laughs> actually worth. I've received one for um, three cents. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Keep, keep it coming. I had, a student, I had a student loan thing that came that was like asking me for like 37 cents. You like know, I paid off my student loans one, with like with one of my first, you know, big checks. I paid off my student loans, yeah. but I calculated it like on the wrong part of the month. Yes. And they actually sent me back like, no, thank you. Nothing, which is cool. It's like, I mean, the money was owed, but just a, a bill for like 37 cents. It's kind of bordering on rude. Yeah. So I taped I taped a dime to the, to the thing. And sent it back and asked them to. <laughs> you taped a dime? Yeah. No. I'm going to ask them to send me, you know, <laughs> the rest in installments. This is, and this is I never true. Heard, I never this heard from them again. This is true story. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> but um, that's really, anyway, that's, okay. that's not much about acting. So that's, that's uh, about. That's, that's everything about, a, about That's acting. about a bad attitude. That's about, so. that's through, that's through the use of the imagination, which is a big part of acting. So yeah, well, that, that well, is a, well that's a, that's a dislike for authority that has nothing to do with it. That's probably also part of being an actor. Why we become actors. That's so great. Okay. So then, I'm part right, of it. okay. I'll ask, here's a question. How about it? Here's a question. And then I'm going to, and then Feel I'm going to open up the floor. Cause I'm going right. to. Be able it. to engage with all the other people that are working on your material and have questions. Um, so as aforesaid mentioned, um, you, Neil, have been really at source for us to continue creating, to um, a source of inspiration, a, a source of creative fire, a source of um, excitement, uh, uh, access to growing, developing ourselves. You have been such a source um, for us. And um, that in cahoots with the actor's imagination, you know, has created, you know, a lot of creative explosions and electrocutions. <laughs> and uh, in a good way, good electrocutions okay. in the studio and among students, good, a good electrocution. And okay. um, so I guess the question would be, you know, we are in so many ways sourcing from ourselves and sourcing from you, sourcing from you, the writer. Um, to give us, you know, the aliveness of being an actor um, and the aliveness of life. So wh where, where, where do you source from? Is it, are you sourcing from your imagination? When you're writing your plays, when you're creating these stories, when you're coming up with these characters, are you sourcing from your life, your imagination, what you've noticed in life, what you, uh, what you wish you would notice? Like, are, wh where are you, what, what's its source for you? in your stories, which have so much bravery and rawness and audacity and depth and courage. And each and every one, when I read a play of yours, it's like I go through a ripping transformational pain, again, in a good way. But you know, where, are you, where do you source from? Um, so where do you begin from or source from? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Next question. No, okay. um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's always different. It's every time I think out, it's always, I, I, I mostly try to build from my imagination. You know, it's, I can't say that there has occasionally not been something ripped from the headlines of, of my life or somebody else's life or, but, but extremely rarely. And, um, and not without really thinking it through. You know, yeah. um, I wrote a play a few years ago called Some Girls, which was about someone who was yes. was writing, you know, well, was visiting yeah. ex-girlfriends while also recording them and, you know, had written a lot from from his his own past, which mm -hmm. couldn't be, you know, really kind of further from my own life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, make it up sort of storyteller. Lots of people 
do the other thing, you know, which is like they they tell their story a few dozen times. They tell their parents' story. They, you know, they call from the, the headlines. Um, but it's rarer for me to to do that sort of thing. You know, I, I wrote a, a thing called The Mercy Seat a few years ago, and yes. that was you know, not even based in reality. It was based in a, a time frame that was real, um, but it was a story that was completely fictional and just yeah. sort of a what if. Yeah. Um, and and me- most of my plays, you don't open it and there's a, like a setting that says, you know, this year and this is what was going on politically and all that. Uh, I'm much more interested in kind of the politics between the people involved. Mm-hmm. Um some things have have been, you know, a little more. At least I know that world. Uh, you mentioned in a dark, dark house. You know, I I grew up with a brother, and I I grew up as I said, in a very blue collar world, and had a tough father, and you know, but that's sort of where that ends. Like I could write responsibly from a place of knowing what that felt like, yep. but not what that you know that story was completely. Yep. Um, Completely, I should say, yes. uh, knowing some parts of it. Um, the Money Shot, something I wrote a few years ago, a, this comedy. Um, the basis for that came from someone I was I was directing a show in in London, and I, th- I think it was an, uh, the assistant director told me this this story about. Um, this situation that had come out of this, this film, this film was called um, Intimacy. Okay. And Mark Rylance was in, um, and he's now done a lot of like work in theater and film or in TV and film. Yeah. But at the time he hadn't done a lot. He'd mm-hmm. done maybe Angels and Insects. And he did this movie Intimacy with Kerry Fox. Mm-hmm. And um, this French director directed it. It was based on um, Hanif Karishi's um, stories. And um, in it, th- there was an a-, 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 a sex act that was real. I mean, it was like it was there. Yeah. Like not, I-, I don't think it was in real time, but it was touted as part of the part of the film. In that, Carrie and Mark actually did it. It wasn't faked. It wasn't you know. Yes. So, um, but then what the what the what the assistant director told me was. And I don't remember how she knew them. She knew someone connected with one of them mm-hmm. um, and said that before that, they got together, you know, and it sounded so British. <laughs> like we got together over dinner with our partners and we talked about what we were going to do and how did they feel about it. And, ha- you know, we had grouper, you know, and they were like, you know, they had three courses and they talked about, oh, when, when Carrie Fox gives me a blowjob, I just want to make sure that we're cool with, you know. Yeah, all that stuff. So I kind of sat there and went, you got to be fucking kidding me. Really? (laughs) You really did that? Okay. (laughs) Wow. That's a, that's a good story. (laughs) And then I went about plotting about, you know, how am I going to, you know, change that to, to not be their story, but I got to tell that story in some way that, you know, people are, are, are approaching a scene like that yeah. and they get their partners together and, and the play that came out of it came out of it. Yes. But yes. as I say, that's very, that's relatively rare for me. So yeah. it, inspirationally is what? I don't know. Character, sometimes title. Um, sometimes I just write blindly, you know, yeah. to see where it takes me. I like writing. So yeah. that's the good news. And, and I've certainly that's the found... Good. <laughs> over the course of this, well, I guess in the sense that it's not, a, it doesn't feel like a task. You know, sometimes yeah. it does. Sometimes you've you've taken a commission or a job, and you go, "Oh yeah, fuck!" Now I have to do that thing. I have to create something. But um, and it's a little harder to be, you know, with you know time against you and and a blank screen staring at you and expectations. People are calling and you know just checking in on you, see how you're doing. They're not checking in to see how I'm how if I'm healthy. <laughs> They are looking for a script, yeah. you know, so it's, yeah. I know how the game is played, but in life, I know that I still like to just write. And, and this year, if it's been good for anything in those terms, it has been rejuvenating for me as well to know that I still like doing what I'm doing. Cause I feel like it's 20 years ago, yes. you know, 
I feel like I'm wow, at a place wow. 30 years ago where I'm, you know, writing stuff that I don't know when it's going to be done, if it'll ever be done, huh. you know, but I'm doing it because I like it and I'm doing it because I want to, I want to write that story. Huh. Uh, and I hope that, you know, when things are back on track and people feel like going into a theater and sitting next to each other and yeah. that sort of thing, that these things will, will have life, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's, um, it, it's usually not theme. I know that. I know it's not, it's usually not me thinking, oh, I got to write something about poverty or race or, yeah. you know, it's it, that shit just sort of finds its way into your story yeah. as you're working. Things just end up being about something. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I have a couple that aren't about anything, frankly, that, you know, are still in my computer. That if you read them, you go, wow, so that's 75 pages of literally nothing. <laughs> yes. People, they just but, keep fucking talking for some yeah. reason and nothing happens. Well, we might as well call this American Buffalo, you know? <laughs> well, that would be you know, it's great okay. talk. But in the end, you know, every time I see that play, I'm like, huh, that's really, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, man, they're just going to talk about that nickel for a long time. And, yeah. He's finally going to hit that kid and knock shit over. And yeah, but, well, yeah a lot of talk, but you know, it's good talk. Yeah. But not a lot happens. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, front of the which head. Is okay. I mean, watch yeah. waiting for Goodell. Not a lot happens there either. Right. Because it's the something, nothing. It's the everything, nothing, the yeah. everything, nothing. A lot of good like talk that. and lots actually happens. But I yes. mean, in terms of advancing a plot. Yeah, the second act kind of being almost exactly the same as the first act. Oh wait, fuck, he's not coming this time either. How about that? Yes, yeah. I say him. Like, I don't know. Godot could be anybody. I guess you know. So be. I believe they mentioned he's. It's a him, but I, I can't remember now. Yeah, and and the more nothing there is, the more possibility for everything. So I don't know if I answered your question, but you did. Yeah. You I mean, did, and it's it's so beautiful to hear also that this year for you and this during this time there's been a kind of rejuvenation, a kind of, in your own work, a yeah, kind of. to your writing that has like a shimmer to it, like this new shimmer, like it's fresh again, just because of the way. I hope, I hope, yeah. you know, we'll see. Once you, you know, a year from now when you see something and you go, <laughs> wow, that feels like he wrote that with nothing to do. But, you know, <laughs> we'll see. And it'll, and it'll be everything. Um, but and the, yeah the money shot I just did a reading of that play the money shot that is so bananas and it makes me every time I read it it makes you bananas to read that play and um, it's so great to hear how that was born I get that there was a kind of um, something like that how that could um, yeah, you, don't, you don't hear a story like that, that every day so yeah. I, I had to take yeah. advantage of it yeah um, and and well so one more question and then I'll let other people see sure. the power okay. to unmute and mute is so great one more question um, <laughs> this is about power. this is I know it's like he man I have the power Shira he man you guys are too young okay um, so so as we as we dive into your plays you're writing your the characters in particular um, so. It's, a, it's, an, it's an exciting acting problem when we work on your material because it could be construed that a lot of your characters do things that could occur to others as nefarious, as mean-spirited, as evil, as unkind. It could occur that way. And as an actor, when you're approaching a role, you know, crypt, it's, your judgment is like kryptonite on a role. Like if you're playing the part judging the character is kind of like kryptonite it's you can't be underneath inside of have your shoulder behind what the character wants if you're judging the character on a certain level okay. so my the question is you know you know and on a certain level to 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 be an actor and to be an artist to be a writer like my assertion is that it just requires like such a modicum of compassion because in acting classes we're always talking about like don't don't begin work on this role really don't start work on this character whether you're playing someone that's a murderer or what have you don't start work on it until literally you have like broken your heart over the history the life and times of that character so that you have a a, a deep understanding and a profound connection to why they do what they do and you've literally broken your heart over what what built them 
what built their inner and outer architecture such that they do those things. Yeah, we, we say don't even start we're, like if you're judging it, there's going to be no access to it. So I guess the question is, I mean, you've written human beings that are on, you know, ends of the spectrum, you know, uh, in terms of how human beings behave and what they do and what they say. Do you find when you're writing your 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 characters, Neil, that you whether this is unconscious or conscious, like this might not even be a conscious thing, but do you find that you, you, ha you have to break your heart for these people so that you can get your shoulder behind them and fight for them, even if they're fighting for things that are um, ill intended, even if they're fighting for malevolence? Do you find that you as the writer, the author, the father and mother of these characters have to kind of break your heart over them so that you can fight for them, whatever it is they happen to be fighting for? No, no. <laughs> no <laughs> Next simple question. As that. Simple as that. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I think maybe they just they just end up doing that sometimes when they least expect it. Uh, I okay. probably, I I probably have to have a little more distance. You know, interesting. I, I definitely try not to judge them. That's quite true. But it's hard, you know, you can very easily, just like in life, start picking sides. Yeah. And if you go in kind of knowing how the argument's going to go and who's going to win and those things, I write a little more blindly hmm. than that uh, a lot of the time. Even like once I've got the story and I go, okay, you know, 75 pages of them just talking, it is. We're going to do it. If that's, if that's what it is. But... I don't know exactly always where those things are going to lead. And mostly I prefer that. I, rather than some writers are, you know, they, they spend a lot of time putting together a, an outline and bullet points and, you know, and they know how, I mean, to the, to the extent I've seen, you know, people who I admire their, their work um, are able to, you know, the way that, that a page, like a page of, of uh, a screenplay, you know, or a television play might be broken down into, you know, um, eighths and they'd be going, you know, this is, this is five eighths of a page, or this is three eighths of a page, that sort of thing that someone could tell me how many eighths of a page they were going to give a scene, uh -huh. you know, well, that's, that's the husband and wife. And so I think that they're going to be, you know, I think that's going to be probably a, a page and an eighth, maybe, maybe, maybe a page and, and three eighths. And then I'm, you know, they're going to be the scene where they go to the car. That's that's probably two eighths. And that, so that I mean, it's so technical in their heads. They see it in a way that I just don't see the journey. You know, that I prefer to be a little more, not with the lights out, but with the lights dim. You know, and kind of search my way there. And I feel like the danger is you can bump into a corner, but the hope is that it makes the journey that much more unexpected and surprising. And so when somebody turns out to be someone who breaks your heart, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they do shitty things and they break your heart, you know, uh, that's, that's quite a combination. Yeah. Um, so, or, you know, somebody else, an offhanded line that somebody else says about your character, Yeah, you know, it's, that's what I find people don't spend enough time with is like examining people can get so locked into I have this character. I want to play this character because they have the most lines. That's where you start in high school. You know, it's ridiculous. Who's got the, who's got the biggest part? I want that yeah. one. You know, yeah. yeah. God bless. Take it yeah. because it's going to be a good luck. Good luck out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But at some point, you know, you, you, you grab your character and you shake it and you, but there's still like all that stuff that's happening in the margins that, you know, it's like somebody else's stuff or what they say about you or a couple of years ago, I got a chance to, uh, I adapted Uncle Vanya, one yeah. of my favorite plays, maybe, maybe my favorite play. Ooh. And um, I got a chance to direct it in Germany um, with a, a German cast. I don't speak German, but that didn't seem to bother them at all. <laughs> They, um, frankly, they didn't give a shit. They uh, like practicing their English. And so we were right. good as gold. You know, there's, uh, there's some weird point where you're directing and they could have been saying any fucking thing they wanted. And I would have been like, 
Ja, uh, yeah, excellent, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Had no idea. So you, you know, that's just a, it's a great. It was a great example of of trust. You know that they're doing what they said they're doing, and I knew the play well enough to really I could go through and I knew right where they were. Yeah, you know, because having adapted it and all that 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 helped. But we got so caught up in the first wife of the professor who is just discussed very briefly in the yeah. play. And suddenly we got off on this tangent of like, what happened to her and how long did she know Astroff and, and how well did she know Astroff? Did they have an affair? Is that what the professor is so sort of, you know, at, at odds with, with Astroff about? Is that why he won't go near Sonia that she reminds him of the first uh -huh. wife? Uh -huh. You know, all this, did he give, you know, did he help her die? Did he... Did she t steal from him some morphine and kill herself? And that's why when, when Vanya does, it really, you know, all these questions came out of shit that most people don't even like, don't even think about her again. They just move on and it's like me, me, me. And yeah. I'm all for that. It's all, for, you know, ego is an important thing. You gotta, it's, you gotta, it's a little thing that we all have and you gotta take care of it and nurture it and, and be kind to it and be careful because everybody else is happy to bring it down, you know, or break the shell and do all that stuff. So, but you got to think about the whole picture, you know, yes. as an actor. Yes. Sometimes we just rely on our director to think about that. And we just yeah. concentrate and you should concentrate on your character, but there's, you know, some amazing stuff. I was, I was watching, uh, you know, you record shit on your, on your DVR and you're like, yeah. Oh, I'll watch that again. I, you know, you get this much lifetime. And, and so what do I do? I watch, you know, these same movies over and over. Yeah. Um, but I was seeing, I was watching David Lean's um, movie called Ryan's Daughter. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, the, he had a huge success with a bunch of movies. And this movie, you know, he'd won the Oscar a couple of times and he'd had these big films like Lawrence of Arabia, Bridge on the River Kwai, Dr. Zhivago. Yeah. And he did this original screenplay by Robert Bolt and, and the critics tanked it and it didn't do well. And it derailed this guy for like 15 years, 14 years, something like that, before he made another movie. He made one more movie before he died. Um, and so I was like, I'm going I'm to watch Brian's Daughter again. I know it's beautiful and, and there's some stuff I didn't love, but yeah, I'm going to watch it again. And I'm watching Robert Mitchum, who's like this, you yeah. know, cut from a certain right. studio cloth, but cool. He's like, Classic. you know, the Johnny Cash yeah. of actors, you know, he's... Robert Mitchum was, I mean, apparently he was a tough guy, you know, guy to like interview for people. And, um, but he plays this, this part who's, you know, he's, a, he is a, he's, he's cuckolded by his wife. He's a, kind of a gentle school teacher, a part you've never really seen Robert Mitchum play. Mm -hmm. He kind of has to tamp down all the things that have made him Robert Mitchum. Mm -hmm. He's doing a dialect you know, when he's in there and you just watch him playing and he's, he's never fussy. He's never taking focus from other people. And all the time, and I'm watching him and I'm, and I'm you know, it's like watching him and you're calling out. Well, like, why don't you just, you know, tell her you, oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, fine, whatever. Why don't you do, oh, God damn it. Okay, fine. And, you know, I'm watching him make these choices. And at the very end or near the end, somebody says about him, not even himself, he says, you know, he, basically, he married this 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 guy's daughter, mm -hmm. Brian's daughter, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's older than she is, and she has this affair with a British soldier, and it, you know brings great catastrophe to the, the the community and and to themselves. And at one point, her father, who on top of all this shit, she's accused of being a traitor because oh. they believe that she's told the British soldier about these IRA members who were there in town. And it was in fact her own dad who did it. And he doesn't cop to it and lets her take the fall. Huh. But at the end, he says to her, you know, when you first got married, I thought you could have done a lot better than him. But now I look at him and I'm not sure there is anyone better, you know, something to that effect. And I was like, wow, that says a huge amount about that character yes. and it doesn't even come out of his mouth. Really? You know? Yeah. But it's so Mitchum was such a big, you know, larger than life figure who I think just, 
a lot of people would not touch that part. I'm sure yeah. would look at that and go, I don't want to be the guy who gets cheated on and doesn't, you know, fight and do this. I don't, I never punch anybody. I don't do, yeah. you know, and he just, you know, sits back and just lets this thing happen. Yeah. Um, and I, I just appreciate actors like that who, you know, who yeah. have learned how to be still and learn how to react and not just act and, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and what to make of something when they have no lines, you yeah. know, yeah. that those are, those are actors to watch, you know, yeah. you see somebody who does a performance and, and they don't have the usual crutches. Lines are, in a way, they're crutches. You know, yeah. you have something to do. You have a line to say. You have a cigarette to smoke. You take all that away and you're just going to sit and listen to somebody. Mm -hmm. That's the task. That's, you know, that's way. Can you, can you hold an audience when you're doing that? Yeah. I, I worked with um, Phil Hoffman one time mm -hmm. on a play. Mm -hmm. And we just did this benefit. And we, a couple of, I did this play called Autobahn, yeah. which is a collection of, of short plays that take place in cars. Yeah. And we had this really nice cast put together in New York for this benefit. And um, we'd said to, to Phil, you know, you can play any part you want. Mm -hmm. And in one of the pieces, there's a husband who just drives the car. He never says a word. Mm -hmm. Right. And he just listens to his wife talking. Um, and he's like, I want to play that part. I was, <laughs> like, I was like, whoa. I was, at first, I was kind of offended. I was like, oh, he doesn't want to do one of the other parts. Does he not want to learn? Is he being lazy? Yeah. It's like a benefit. So it's like not worth the time. But I realized later how tough that part is, you know, not that part, but that oh. job is to oh. listen to somebody yeah. to not have lines. Yeah. And when it came to the night of the performance, guess who you couldn't take your eyes off of? I'm not surprised. Just sat I'm there surprised. and clutched that steering wheel and he took off his glasses once, he wiped his forehead once, he glanced at his wife one time, and Kira Sedgwick is sitting next to him, and she's talking and talking, and it's nice, and she's doing a great job, yeah. and I can't do anything but stare at this guy. Yeah, and he's a magnet. And unreal. Yeah, and, you know, it takes, you know, there are disciplines in acting training. Um, I teach something called the Meisner Technique, and the whole, the whole premise, the whole couple, first couple years of the training is to get people to actually listen. Like, no kidding. Like, really. Because people pretend to listen 99% of the time. Like, but they're not listening. They're waiting to say what they're going to say. They're waiting for the lines. They're, 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 they're defending what they're hearing. They're not listening. They're trying to force the conversation in a certain way. They're defending themselves. They're avoiding the community. Like, no one's, people aren't listening. And yeah. so there are all these techniques and practices just, and, you know, Meisner said it takes 20 years to really develop yourself into the kind of actor that you were just talking about with, with Phil Hoffman. But just to be able to actually be with another person and 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 be focused on another person out there not making it about you is extraordinary so few actors can do that and the ones that can do that consistently are the ones that are working all the time and it's it, yeah. it, it is so rare to have um actors come into the power and magnitude of their fullest presence and listening and just being there with another human being it's like completely an anomaly for the most part so yeah. there are trainings and practices just to be able to rather than pretend or indicate listening, actually just listening. And the ironic piece, Neil, is what you said. It's exactly, you should teach the class because you're teaching it now. You couldn't take your eyes off the person that was that present and just listening. You couldn't take your eyes off that person. Yeah. So fascinating. Um, so then, okay. Uh, I, I should, we sh someone else should ask a question. I do have the power to mute and unmute, and it's been amazing. And, oh, and, um, this is so, so juicy. By the way, guys, this is lemonade with a little shot of cranberry. That's all that's in there. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Okay. So I was thinking you had a, a good size Mountain Dew there, the way you're going. <laughs> this yeah yeah right this is this is not on caffeine i don't want what am yeah, i gonna no, do with i can't caffeine? imagine I mean, I why, why would you i don't even want to why imagine. would you break your natural high with something on like ca caffeine on caffeine it could very possibly bring me down we don't know what would develop okay so um so some of the actors had some questions and um we had a quest let's see they told me they had some so uh tim can you unmute yourself tim is going to be he's working on the break of noon tim yeah. is working on the role of the detective 
in the break of noon. Um, and uh, I don't know that these questions are necessarily related to the exact roles. They could be more generalized. But um, Tim, meet Neil. Neil, meet Tim. What was your question? Hey, Neil, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Tim. Nice to meet yeah. you. Thank you, too. Um, I actually kind of uh, two little questions here. Uh, okay. the first one, um, regarding like rewrites and everything, it, hmm. are you are you always open to the idea of doing rewrites for something even after it's been put up for production? Or do you ever say to yourself, like, not touching that ever again? Um, um, I'm yeah, I'm. I'm mostly open, you know, um, when I say mostly because some things are sort of, um, if you're talking about theater, which is like, I, I imagine you are because that's, you know, when it, once it's, you've made a film of something or that, that sort of thing, it, it tends just not to get revisited. Maybe, maybe in your lifetime it will, but, but probably not. Um, so that for better or worse becomes kind of a definitive thing. Um, but uh, but in terms of a text, you know that that can be put up on stage. Yeah, I um, sometimes I you know I keep tinkering with shit just because I'm a tinkerer, and I you know you think oh, uh, or all through rehearsals and and in performance, you know I've gi I've given line changes to people actually on the last night on the last performance, handed them a line change and. <laughs> That's really, you know, where people, you kind of see where the two groups of people, one kind of looks at you and goes, really? You, you, you got it. Like, like big line changes or like a little? No, 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 no. I mean, I'm tinkering with words. You know, I'm, I'm shifting things or, hey, you know what? I think this, this might actually be funny. Let's try this or this could, you know what? We should lose that one thing or, you know, not, not new scenes or anything like that. Um, uh, but, but stuff that, you know, you just, you're always, it is kind of a sculpture, you know, mm -hmm. until it's, and it's, and it's, it's finished for now is always kind of the way I look at it. At some point you have to lock something and say, Hey, that's what we're performing at least tonight. Let's, right. let's do that. And, and, uh, let's see how it plays, you know, and, and, and even some nights, you know, you, you listen to a, a joke and you're like, that that was supposed to be a joke. That that didn't work. That some they either missed it or it's it's one of those audiences. Weirdly, audiences can kind of like be a collective experience sometimes. You know, it's like you go, oh, that was a quiet audience. That was a oh wow, that audience was. We talk about them as a you know an entire organism as opposed to made up of all these different people. But for some reason, they do kind of feed off the thing and the energy and that particular performance. And and so you know you try it a couple more nights and you're like. Yeah, no, I take it back. That's not a joke. It's because it jokes actually. are funny. Jokes usually actually make people laugh, and that doesn't make anybody laugh. So yeah, I take right. it back. let's take that out. I might still put it in the printed version because I still think it's funny, <laughs> but I think maybe we should just take it out. Right. But, you know, then one night somebody laughs, and you're like, ah, see? Ah! You, you said it the right way that time. No, you blame, yeah. I'm, you know, blaming it on the actor. But um, sure. Well, why not? I mean, they're yeah, there. It's so. their fault. It's their fault. Um, it's easier to. So. But it's, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I like the process. So rewriting doesn't, some people think it's a real chore, I guess. They want that creative thing that I'm, I'm creating something new, whereas rewriting can be going over the same stuff and, you know, it gets boring or tiresome or just, you know, you feel like I've, I've come to the end of this, I'm, I'm done, you know. Um, and I, I, I'm not as just as much that way. I, I rarely think it's, you know, perfect out of the pen. And, you know, I want to keep working on it. And I want to see it when it gets into the mouth of an actor. That's really where it, you know, becomes alive anyway. It's now personified. Someone is, you know, becoming that conduit to the audience. And so that's hugely important. Now we have an audience, you know, the, the, the circle just keeps expanding of, of, you know, ways that you need to, hear it, you know, and people that you need to hear it with. Um, so, and then when somebody comes to you, let's say, you know, a year later, and they're like, hey, we're doing this, this new production of it, and we'd, you know, we'd love to, but I've, um, in, in, in a good example of it would be um, uh, in a dark, dark house, was after it was performed, uh, a friend of mine, I'd, I'd worked with this director in, in England, and he wanted to do it at a theater in England, but he said, you know, for my money, um, I feel like the, there's three sort of 
distinct chunks to that play. And he said, I feel like you're overloaded in the last chunk. Mm. I feel like that there's information there that if we moved some of this information over to the first scene, mm. the balance would be stronger. And I would go into the second scene with a greater sense, not even of urgency, but of dread. Mm. I would walk into that, that mini golf course and worry more for that young woman. Huh. If I realize that Terry, spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, that right. Terry <laughs> is, you know, in the same situation as his brother and or he believes that information, you know, that is that so that if, if we found out um, that he had been with the one of the characters uh -huh. and or abused by that character. Yes information that we learn in the third scene, if we knew that in the first scene, uh -huh. it would create a greater sense of conflict and drama. And, uh, and, it would and the third scene, would we'd already rush into that knowing that. He wouldn't have to confess that. He, we would come into it knowing it. And I listened to that and I thought, yeah. Wow. Super smart. Really good idea. Let's change it. So I worked it all around and uh, made that work. And so the, the published American version has yeah. the version that was off Broadway and the version that was done in England is published in England. And uh, you can get wow. both, but I think the better version is that second version. So, um, and I would still go back. You know, I, there were there was some, some people who did it not so long ago in New York who contacted me and they're like, hey, we'd love you to come see it. But I had a question about a couple of things and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, no, you can cut that. Or yeah, this is, uh, you know what, let me look at that line for a minute. And uh, hmm. obviously I have too much time on my hands. Um, <laughs> but I just like, you know, I like the work. I, I like this. Yeah. I like this work. Remember, I told you I've, I've shoveled shit. So I, you know, right, I yeah. know the, everything beats you know, that. I know the <laughs> continuum of what jobs can be. Yeah. And I would much rather be tinkering on lines for a play than than uh, than working in a in a bar. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. not you know. My brothers, you know, we grew up in, on a farm, and and he's never left, never left that left that farm, but mm -hmm. bought bought another farm, and I, I go back as rarely as I can. So, mm -hmm. got it. You know, people people love what they love, and so yes. Um, yes. God bless. But I uh, I would much rather be you know tinkering on a on a play than than that. So. Yeah. Um, if that answers your question, yeah, I, I yes, really, absolutely. that part at least, I, um, I'm i always open. It doesn't mean I'm going to change. You know, I, I try to listen to people um, and, and may the best idea win. Um, but in the end, you have to make a decision about these things, you know, on your own and go, yeah, but it's still ultimately, you know, it's my play and I'm going to, I'm going to stick to this or, you know, sometimes it comes down to, hey, this is their interpretation of it. And if they want to lose that, um, there's a reading tomorrow night of a, of a play of mine that uh, uh, reasons to be happy. Oh, great. Uh, this group had done reasons to be pretty and they asked if they could read the other two. And I was like, yeah, go for it. Um, but they, they recently wrote me and they were like, Oh shit. You know, you say a line about, about Asians in, in there and we're wondering, should we keep it or not? Or, and I was like, Yeah. I mean, it's, I wrote it. I mean, it's the, it's, mm -hmm. I didn't write it yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very clear about what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if it really throws you and you're just totally worried about it, then here's the cut you should make. Or I even sent them a line that said, here's a variation you could have that makes it clear to the, an audience right now what is being said. Um, and I said, you, you decide what you want to do. Yeah. So, um, the short answer would have been yes, but there I've given you a, a longer, a longer answer, which was extraordinary. You had another yeah. quick question. Tim? I do it, this one. Yeah, yeah the second right. one's kind of a quick one. Yeah, so um, I'll be uh, some yeah, right. uh, <laughs> regarding <laughs> some girls, some girls, right? Yes, uh, with all the all of the women having predominantly male or slash unisex names what yeah. was the kind of rationale behind that you know it's a lonely job you're sitting there by yourself 
you got to keep yourself entertained. Right. <laughs> At some point, I saw that, you know, these names were popping up, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to, you know, yeah, I'm just going to keep this going. I'm just going to, all the women that are named are going to have what are vaguely male and or unisex names. And anytime that a guy is mentioned, he's going to have what could be a unisex or a female sounding name. Hmm. And, you know, there, there you go. No mystery beyond that. It's not much of a rosebud, really. In, in the <laughs> I end. like it. I appreciate yeah. that kind of answer. <laughs> that, as I say, you just sometimes you're sitting there and you just got to like, got to make yourself happy. And so yeah. you you come up with, you know, names. I have a lot of people that, you know, you name start naming shit Tom and Jerry and, you know, <laughs> yes. and stuff like that. Brilliant. Cool. Well, thank you. Awesome. No, no problem. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Just the way you're um, good detective work on that, Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. And way to, way to dream, way to dream to your heart's desire, Neil. So Caroline had a question. Caroline, you are, where are you? Unmute yourself. Where, Can you say hello? Caroline? There you are, there is. Caroline. Caroline, meet Neil. Neil, meet Caroline. Caroline is Hi, working Caroline. on, um, Caroline is working on uh, Diva and TV Jenny host in, uh, in, 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 um, break of noon and she's also working on a scene from fat pig the uh, genie tom scene from fat pig so um, right. take it away caroline okay so neil i've i have a very specific question Great. uh so i have a rambling incoherent answer for you. <laughs> you not i don't know but i can't ask you so I've read so much of your material and I've always fallen in love with the way you build your characters in the scenes and there was one specific moment I wanted to ask you about from sure. the shape of things which was perfect that Robin brought it up and it's one of my favorites um and specifically in the scene at the very end of the play when adam is asking evelyn if there was ever one genuine moment during their relationship mm -hmm. and after giving it some thought she says in my bed one night when you leaned over and whispered in my ear and i want to know <laughs> will you tell us what adam was <laughs> that night and how she responded Say the last part. It tells you what what Adam said. Yes, and how Evelyn, what she whispered back to him. Um, well, I I will I will speak for the um, the first production which I directed and uh, and then turned into a movie with the, so the same cast did it in in London and then they did it in New York and then we we shot it in um, Los Angeles. Um, so I was with that group for a long time you know, working on it and, and honing that. And um, we, um, I, I, the honest answer is I don't know. I, I could, I could speculate on a bunch, but you could too. Um, there's only so many kinds of things that it could be, probably is my guess. Um, but what I didn't want to do is have a definitive thing. Uh, what I really wanted was, I love like um, moments like that, you know, uh, something that I, I I got to be a part of, but didn't know all the answers, or had to figure something out, or mysteries, or secrets, or that kind of thing. Um, so I advised them because, of course, they asked me the same thing. Geez, what do you want us to say? What I said was uh, it was Paul Rudd and Rachel Weisz were doing the the original production, and I said, well, what I would like it to be is something that's between the two of you. It can change as often as you like, but it has to be something that, that fits the characters, not just Paul and Rachel, you know, fucking around, um, you know, because you're, or you saw somebody in the audience and you're whispering, oh my God, there's so-and-so, you know, shit like that. It had to be, you know, part of their, their connection with each other. And, but I didn't want to know. And I didn't want the other actors to know. I didn't want the audience to know. I wanted that to be special to, to the two of them, to have that secret between them. Uh, in the same way that um, the Jenny character and, and the uh, Adam character go off and something happens between them and, and Evelyn smells a rat 
but she's not quite sure. She makes a, a stab at it, but you know, we're never quite sure exactly what happened between them. Um, and I, and uh, Gretchen Maul was playing that part. And I said to Gretchen and to Paul, you guys go off and decide what happened. You know, it can be obviously a little or a lot, but I need you to land on the same thing. So you're both, you know, thinking of, of that same thing when you see each other and you have those moments on stage. But don't tell me, don't tell Rachel, <laughs> don't tell um, anybody else what's, what it was so that you have that secret between you. And then Evelyn throws out a bomb of like, oh, I kissed Phil. Did you not realize that? Or And they're like, wait, well, no, that didn't fucking happen. She's like, oh, really? Um, between her and Phil, I said the same thing. Fred Weller played that part. I said, look, you guys decide if that happened or not, but don't let me know. I, I'll, I'll read it on your faces each night. I'll try and decide if you, you did that or not. Um, so I fostered a, a world in which there was some secrecy there. Um, since so much of it was the show was built on, you know, information or misinformation or information that was kept from people, you know, the whole thing is a ruse in the end. And you have two people who are looking at each other and how can they possibly connect when they're actually not even speaking the same language? You know, one is saying, it doesn't even compute when you're talking about love because I never could have loved you. You were this thing to me, right? Uh, is that true? Is she telling the truth? Or is she, I, you know, I, I like that kind of thing and I don't really necessarily want to know the answer. So that's my answer for you is that there was no answer. Um, I don't know if that's the same. Robin can tell you if that was the same in her play or not. Um, I don't know. I don't I'll never care. tell. I'll never tell. I'll never <laughs> Good enough. I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, it's not on the page. Yeah. It's not in my notes. Right. Um, people have asked me that before. Um, and I've said some version of the same thing, which is, I don't know, you know, and I don't, uh, I don't really, I don't really, you know, care to, I don't, I don't mind speculating, but it's, I, I there's no right answer. So it's, we're just kind of spinning our wheels, really. It's, you know, it is, it's what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that obviously affected him, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, Again, there's only there's. I think there's only a handful of things of kinds of things that it could be, but I'm not really worried about what it was exactly. It it it, it fulfilled its dramatic need, and has you know to this day twenty years. This is the twenty. This is the twentieth anniversary of that. Oh, you know, happy anniversary! That, <laughs> wow. that um, wow. you know, people here still to this day ask that question. So that's um, that's a job well done, at least on that yes. one. Yes. So great. And I, I love that you're, you know, inside of what you shared around, you know, for you when you're writing, like when you were talking to Tim about um, the names, like it's a choice. It's just a choice you that you dream up and it, it's, it's something that happens in your creative space. And in the same way, you know, the actors, that's what, you know, it's the actor's job to, like you do, sculpting and crafting to make, you know, those choices that make it real and vivid and alive for themselves and the audience. Yeah, the ch choices, choices, choices. That's so brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Great question. Thank you. I was hoping we might get an answer, Neil, but no, I'll wait till the 40th. Well, maybe the 40th anniversary. Maybe in the 40th, right. right. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. So let us, oh, Christian, you had a question. Can you unmute yourself, Christian? Are you there? Unmute yeah. yourself. We're going to spotlight you. Okay, great. All right. So, Christian, meet Neil. Neil, meet Christian. Hello, hello. <laughs> I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find Christian here. He's in a. He's actually in a Hollywood awesome. Square with two people. He's with Maggie, who's also going to ask a question in a little bit. Maggie is actually um in a dark, dark house. Is playing the um the young lady in a dark, dark house yeah. in our second act. And Christian is not in a dark, dark house, but had a question. Um, Where is Christian? All right, wave, wave. Oh, there you go. Okay, got him now. He's so in, you've got yep. yes. All right. So cool. Hey, Christian, how are you? Awesome. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Great. Great. I was just curious. Do you ever find yourself inspired by like conversations in life? Like, will you have a conversation and be like, oh, oh sure. sure. That's a cool sentiment. Let me build on that. Or is it usually just kind of straight out of your 
brain. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, you know, there's things you get, or you, you talk to somebody about a subject or something that, you know, fragments into, into something more creative. Um, yeah, or something you think about from years ago, you know, that, that, that sparks you. It's, it's all potential material. I guess, you know, in the end, you just have to make decisions about, um, is it yours? Is it, is, it, is it everybody's? Is it, you know, what is it? That, that, that stuff that's out there. Um, some people have no issue. Like, you know, it's like if it's, been, if it's been said and, you know, we had that conversation, then it's fodder for the factory for, for me to do my work. And, and, you know, sometimes you'll find people who think I can't, you know, I can't do that. I'm not a vampire. I'm not going to like, you know, I'm not going to take that stuff from, from you. And, and uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm somewhere in between, I guess, you know, I, I guess I either had a really boring family, you know, that I, there was nothing <laughs> I really wanted to take from any of them. None of their stories were interesting enough to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably not true. I mean, if I really sit down and think I can go back, Oh, this happened in my grandmother's life. And that was, that was very interesting, but I, I don't necessarily want to tell that story or, you know, my parents were this and um, there was plenty of fireworks, you know, mm -hmm. but, but, not fireworks that I'm necessarily interested in. Um, so, yeah, it can be the most seemingly inane or, you know, simple thing that comes, you know, that, 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 that gets you going on, on stuff. Uh, I just, I, I never know where it really comes from. I, but what I do is I do spend a lot of time when, when people say, oh, do, you, do you write a lot? You know, I, I say, yeah, I write all the time. But what I mean is that I'm in my head, you know, you can't turn it off. You don't, you don't punch a clock and say, Oh, at five, I stopped thinking. Yeah. I've met a couple of people who actually start stopped about four 30, I think, <laughs> but I, you know, you, you, you work and you do whatever, you know, you dream, you wake up and you're still thinking about something. I take an idea and I really, you know, give it a good shake. And, and because you have to spend a lot of time, you have to, you have to kind of love these things, you know, in, in some fashion, you have to think, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write this thing, I'm going to rewrite it, it's going to, going to try and, you know, get it into somebody's hands and get it on its feet or make that film or raise the money to make that film or all that stuff. I can't just be like a little, oh, it'd be fun to make a movie about whatever, you know, or it'd be great to, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do a Western? Yeah, that would be cool. But, you know, is there a story that, that you really want to tell? And if not, on the other hand, I don't carry around like, Here's that next story. I, I am until I tell this one, I will not rest and I will not do another story. Mm -hmm. I, I, I write a couple things at a time, often in the same way that I read several books at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it helps if I if I get into a jam on one, I can switch over and just keep the act, that creative act, you know, going and, and just doing that. The Repetition of that in the same way, like learning lines, the same way as like running a scene. Those all just kind of keep you in the world of what you do. So, um, yeah, having conversations is part of life, but it also does lead to stuff. So does, you know, a line in a book. The other day I was, um, I was you know, I, over the course of this past year, I've spent a lot of time either reading and or listening to a lot of books that, you know, for some reason I felt like, I had read or, you know, knew enough about or have seen the movie. And then, you know, you find yourself going, have I actually ever read Pride and Prejudice? <laughs> I'm like, no, I actually have. I haven't read Pride and Prejudice. Well, fuck that. I'm not going to read it. But then you go on to something else. No, I did read it. Um, but, you know, I, every so often you, you, you do that. And so I've, I've, I've nailed a, a few books that I was like, oh, God, I actually never read that. So. And uh, what what book was it in? It was in, um, I think it was in Howard's End. Oh, uh, again, I you know I've seen this movie, I've seen a series, and I'm like I've never actually sat down and read Howard's End. Mm. And I should have because Forster is a beautiful writer. Mm. Um, but there was a line at the end of one chapter. No, I take it back. It, it, it's it's Forster, but it's actually a room with a view. It's oh. a room with a view, and a line at the end of one chapter said darkness enveloped the flat. And that was it. I was like, wow, that's a good line, man. Darkness enveloped the flat. 
you mm. just like kind of said mm. everything. Mm. And so I would like to start carrying that line around. And I was like, wow, am I going to write something? And suddenly, you know, I'm, I just wrote down the flat and I start writing. And, you know, it hasn't really gone that far yet anywhere, but it sparked. So it's not a conversation, it was a conversation I had with a book. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that line struck me in a way that um, the rest of that chapter didn't or other parts. I mean, I, I love the book, but um, that just leapt out at me. And I was like, bam, you know, and sometimes it's a song lyric. Sometimes it's a song title. It's a, I've written a lot of plays that have titles of songs on them mm-hmm. um, over the years now. And um, you never know. Mm-hmm. For me, it's never, it's never the, which is exciting. You know, it's, that's part of the greatness of the job. Jumping in, or or somebody you know gives you a job. Wow, what a nice thing! And but I've never been a part of that world. And you now I've got to do some research on on this and that, and you know, so I, I get to travel to places that I might not, you know, or back in time, or um, it's a it's a great part of what we do is that we get to become these people. We get to work on these things in the relative safety. It, you know, it should always be as safe as, as it can be. And when I mean safe, like, you know, you sh- someone should create a net for you that you can do all the crazy shit that you need to do to, you know, be free and, and tell a story and make a character and, and feel like people aren't waiting to go to lunch and people aren't laughing at you and people, mm-hmm. you know, give you all the time in the world. One of the things you'll find, I don't know how much TV and film you guys have done versus theater or whatever, but you'll find that the TV and film process is such a crazy one. You know, it's like, they're not, it's not that they're not your friend. It's just like, so you're, a, you're not a close friend. <laughs> you're, you know, they, <laughs> they look at you and you're like, apparently you're magic. You're like a kind of a unicorn. So whenever they want you to turn it on, they just expect you to turn it on in an instant and be perfect and, and get it done in a couple of takes. And so we can move on to the next thing, you know, and, Whatever we need to do economically, we're going to worry about that. And we're not going to worry about emotionally how it's affecting you or, or you and your co-star. This is the first day you've met, but fuck, we really need to do that bed scene. So <laughs> why don't we just do that? You know, it's not about, hey, let's like try and not just even shoot in continuity, which of course is, is tough to do. But it's always about the lighting. It's always about something else. It's about, oh, we've only got this location today all that money and all that time is spent on the DP and this and that. And then when your turn, they're like, look, we've only got 20 minutes before lunch. You think we can cram this in? And you're like, fuck, I know. I don't know. I really don't know if we can. I really don't want to walk down there and ask those guys Mm -hmm. if they think they can cram it in before you eat your fucking cutlet. Yeah. You know, Um, we'll see what we can do, but you'll find that many times you'll be asked to just do the impossible or the near impossible and, uh, and be happy about it or, you know, you'll, or you'll be difficult. Um, but, you know, just hold on to that thing that you have and, and uh, fight for, you know, the best thing you can do best, uh, get another take, do a, you know, try it again. Mm-hmm. Um do what you're supposed to do. They really want you. They hired you, I hope, to do a, a good job. But then, you know, there's never enough time. There's never enough money. And, and they always try and make up time with the actors. Um, and you got to you, hopefully, you know, make friends with the director yeah. or the <laughs> producer or somebody. And just, you know, when you need to, need to ask for that extra time, that extra take, you know, hopefully you can, you can call that in because it's... Um, it's a weird, it's a weird way to work, you yeah. know. It's a Very weird. Different. I don't know how you guys do it, frankly. It's it's psychologically tough, and it doesn't seem like that's the you know you'd want the best from your employees if you want to put it down to that base an impulse, mm-hmm. yeah, and yet we constantly are finding ways to you know abuse the privilege. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas in the theater, you know, we all sit down together and it's like yeah. rehearsal on day one. We're all in the same place. We're all moving this way. Yeah. We're all learning it. We're not all learning it at the exact same rate or this or that, but we're all kind of staging it. And, and at the end, we all kind of come together and poof, there it is. The magic. We've got to play. Yeah. Um, in, in movies, you know, day one, they want day one to look as good as day 25. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What job does that work in? Yeah. How, many, how many times have you gone to a job and you're as good 
on your first day as you are a month later. Yeah. Or Shoveling in, shit. In that is about the time that it worked for me. Yeah. Every other job, there's a learning curve, but mm -hmm. apparently you guys are magic and you, you know, day one and same for me, they want, you know, they don't want the, they don't want to look at the first day's rushes, the dailies and go, well, it's pretty good for day one. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's kind of sucks, but it's not bad. For they the day, want. Day one. they mm -hmm. want it to be perfect. They want to have spent their money on, on it and be perfect. So get as much time as you can in front of a camera Take your own camera and, you know, shoot yourself as much as you can stand to watch and uh, just get used to being still in front of a camera. Mm. Work on that, that continuity. Work on, you know, whatever the hell you can work on that, yeah. that gets you to feel like when they do, just like everybody's looking at you and you can look past the camera and you see them all yawning and, you know, checking their watch and <laughs> you can just blank that shit out and say, doesn't matter. This is all about me right now. Yeah. I'm going to do my thing. And, you know, you've, uh, many times I've, I've had actors who are like, can we just, can we just get everybody out from behind the camera? And you think, oh, I get it. And a lot of people think, oh, wow, temperamental, aren't we? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know what? Not temperamental. Just want to do the best I can do. Yeah. Just yeah. want to give you I didn't come out here while the guy was hanging the lights and go, hey, man, what's going on? Hey, how are you? What's going on? You want to go get some lunch? Yeah. And I expect you to do the same thing. But somehow, weirdly, actors are treated in a different mm. way. And so you just got to be careful out there that it doesn't throw you. Because once you get thrown, it's, it is hard to get back mm -hmm. in that place. I mean, I've had friends mm. working with friends who have gotten thrown by something and I can see it in their eyes, man. They're just, they're not there with you. And they're like, I don't know how to get back to that place. And I know the clock is ticking, but what can we do? You know, how can we stop time and, and give me a second to like regroup? Um, and you, that, you have to just fight for that time. And you go, we're going to suck it up and we're going to take a meal penalty and we're going to give you 15 more minutes. Yeah. So that's, that's where we'll start. And if it takes 30, then... Someone's going to be bitching in my ear, but we got to try and do it because yeah. um, it's terrible to ask somebody just to walk away yeah. and, and, you know, you already walk away. You give us your performance and you go home and you hope to God some of it gets on the screen and you go see the movie and you're like, I swear I was in this. Oh, God. Or I swear I was a lot better because they cut out the scene where, oh, yeah, they don't explain that I was a junkie. So... I just seem to have the shakes for no apparent reason. Yeah. So cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was because they needed to cut it five minutes out of it. So it's, yeah. we ask you to do a tough job. So yeah. Um, and try you got to take, I... take care of yourselves as yeah. well. Wow. I, that, I went everywhere with that. No, oh, it's so, I, it's so I, brilliant. I hope that, I hope that it, helps. It's so brilliant because you're talking about like just not abandoning yourself. Do you know what I mean? On some level. Yeah, and, in front and, of people. I mean, yeah. being left yeah. to hung out to dry in yeah. front of a hundred people. Yeah, so really staying 50 on of, side. fifty of who do not really care. Yeah, you know, you want everybody on the set to f care about it the way you do, and you will find that they just don't. They don't all feel the same way. Yeah, and and that doesn't mean they don't do good work sometimes. Yeah. But man, are they ready to go when it's time to go, and ready to eat when it's time to eat? And you know, it's just a job. To yeah. them, a job that they might even like, but it is yeah. just a job. Yeah, and I don't ever feel that way about it. Yeah, sometimes I do great, sometimes I do don't, don't do as great, but I I always love doing it. Yeah, so. yeah, and it's so brilliant. Yeah, because they exactly they're getting ready to get their cutlet. It's on you to take care of cutlet. Your, what a good word, right? Where did that come from? Good. It's so good. Where well, did that come from? Probably getting hungry. It's, it. it's dinner time. It's dinner time. Where are the yeah. Where are the days so far? That's so great. Um, so great after class, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, staying on your side, staying on your side in those moments. So it's just awesome. Thank you. That's a great question and answer. So we have another. We have another one. Uh, Sahaja was going to ask a question. We have okay. more. Sahaja was going to ask a question. Um, 
is, Hi. are you on? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, Sahaja. Meet Neil. Neil, meet Sahaja. Sahaja is working Hello. on, um, Sahaja is working on, she, when I first met Sahaja, she was working on a scene from the mercy seat and she's currently working on ginger in, um, break of noon. She's working on the ginger role in the break of noon has worked on the mercy seat and the other things. Um, what was your question, Sahaja? My question, a lot of my questions actually have been answered. Um, I just want to say also that I love, this is so not a question, but I just want to tell <laughs> you that the way the women get to um, really speak this like deep uh, truth with the men in, in the scenes that I've done is like very cathartic. Um, and that's sort of not my question though, but I just wanted to say that because as you, I, talking, I appreciate you saying it though. Thank you for yeah. that. I, I've, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard to the contrary as well. So oh, I, I appreciate really? you okay. saying it. Well, I've only worked on two of your plays. So, you know, <laughs> so there could be many stinkers <laughs> out there that you right. haven't read. So but they haven't come my way and, um, but I'm sure I wouldn't feel that way anyway. I hope not. So my question is this, you know, in, in the mercy seat in the forward, you talk about how, you know, it just, the play basically poured out of you on an airplane. Um, and I guess, you know, just in terms of your process, do you have readers, like it, it pours out of you, you get off the plane, you're like, wow, I've just written this. <laughs> do you do you like send it to your best friend or to your agent or, you know, what what is your process? You know, um, That's a good question. It's a, you know, again, it's a mix. It's sometimes... Uh, sometimes my best reader is me, you know, you trust yourself and, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes, you know, you're, you feel like you're too close to it. I don't always feel that way. Um, but, but yeah, sometimes I got to have somebody read it, you know, sometimes you have to hear it read, you know, you need people to actually, you know, do the equivalent of putting it on its feet and hearing actors speak those lines. Um, I think I'm, you know, I don't fancy myself an actor. I think I'm a pretty good reader, you know, uh, once I get up and then the body's involved and, you know, where do you put your hands and, you know, why are they looking at me? All that shit starts to, you know, happen and, and I'm ready to sit back down. But um, in terms of, you know, hearing the music of, of the thing and how it, you know, I, I try and sometimes I'm trying to overlap stuff and and just have the the normal process that that thought takes you know where just like what i just did that you know you have a moment where you pause or you say the same word over and over until you get to the next part that you know what you want to say stuff like that trying to put that on the page and just, did i get that right you know did i did i put enough ands you know one after the other until you know should i use another ellipses i god knows i haven't used enough yet so let's put in another one um <laughs> Because in those margins, you know, it's like a, you know, when you, when you get these scripts as actors, it's like a, it's like a coloring book, you know, when you like you used to get a coloring book and you'd go and home and you, you know, you can put in whatever color within those, you know, whatever makes sense. If it's like, yeah, I've seen a dress that color, so I'm going to use that color scheme. I, I, I want this to be this color. I want to color outside the lines a little bit. And you have that, that free, anything that I haven't put on the page you have the freedom to imagine, to, you know, break it up in the way that you decide to, to say it. So it's, it's great to hear five different people read the same part, you know, to hear how many different ways are there to do this. That's the, the fun of seeing another production, you know, or, or multiple productions is, is seeing that, oh, why? or, you know, somebody doing it for the 20th time and you go, God, I've never heard anybody say that line that way. That's what a cool read on that or a question about a character that, you know, you hadn't thought of and might not even have an answer for. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it feels like it's, you're constantly doing that, mm -hmm. you know, but if the first, if I don't have like one reader. It's not like, wow, I'm going to send it to my agent first. I'm going to send it to my editor, the one who, who eventually will look at it probably more than anybody because they keep sending me versions that are marked up and did you notice this? And, oh, my God, you still managed to miss a, you know, a misspelling. And back and forth, that process goes and goes. So would that person be the best one? To, I, it's just it's sort of on impulse sometimes. 
you're like, ah, you know, I should send this to so and so, see what they think. They, you know, they don't know anything about this, but they, they're, uh, I think they're, they, they would like this one. They get it, and uh, so it, it just, it just, it just depends. Sometimes I have to just sit on them and and have nobody read it, and I say I'm going to look at it in a month from now, see how I feel. I got to get, I got to get a little distance from it. Um, it's never the same thing for me. Uh, it's just, you kind of go with your gut. I've gone with my gut a lot along the way. And it's, uh, it's misled me some, it's been right on the money sometimes. And, but usually I can, I can trust myself as much as I can trust anybody. And so I just kind of follow my, my instincts. That's beautiful. That teaches the whole class. If actors could just learn, if we could learn to trust ourselves and to go with our instincts. That would it's, be, yeah, that it's would hard. Be, Trust is perfect. tough one. Trust it's, is tough. It's, it's huge. Yeah. And it's a grapple, the, the whole ride. It is. Yeah. On some level. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's so rich. Um, great. Thanks, Sahaja. And um, we actually... What, Sahaja? And I volunteer to be a reader. I'm joking. But... <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, we have some, the cast cast of In a Dark, Dark House. So, Skip, you were there. Hi, Skip. Skip is working on the Terry role in A Dark, Dark House. And um, it was amazing when we... I looked uh, right at Skip before I even knew who Skip was. I just saw that dark frame and it caught my eye there. That's it's just it. head floating in there. There's so. Terry. It's got to be. It could be no one nicely, else. Nicely presented, Skip. I wish uh, everybody's backdrop was as... As arresting as that. <laughs> no, I, prefer no. good, I prefer a good fake digital tropical scene, but I appreciate uh, what you've done here. Well done. Well played, Skiff. What was your question? Oh, it was apropos for the play. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for joining us, Neil. This is just my pleasure. Amazing. And uh, I really appreciate uh, all the plays that you've written and uh that I've gotten to uh, work on because of them. Um, there's so much to unpack from this play, and uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, pour through it and, um, yeah, just try to uh, deconstruct and reconstruct so many things. And there's a lot of things that you've left, um, you know, um, open-ended and... Um, which is great for the actor because in you know, my earlier comments about yeah mysteries and exactly. lies and secrets yeah exactly so I wanted to resist uh, asking you you know questions like who's Terry calling at the end of the first act or uh, what exactly happens to Jennifer um, obviously it's something bad um, but that being said. Um, Something that I thought might clarify. Oh, I should preface that we are working on the off-Broadway edition. So um, I might have a question about uh, what you tinkered with in London. Um, but in terms of um, sort of a timeline thing that we've been discussing as a cast. So the way I interpret it is that whatever Terry does to Jennifer is motivated by the fact that Todd doesn't recognize him when he confronts him. And to that end, I also interpreted that when Terry meets Jennifer, that he has not yet had that encounter with Todd. And we've kind of come up with, you know, perhaps some sort of way to figure that out in the timeline. But I was just wondering if, you know you had a way to clarify that or if that's just up to interpretation i think that's i think that's accurate as i recall um that in fact going into that that second scene he has yet to see todd and uh and then his his meeting with her i'd have to look at that again but i believe his meeting with her is um well, I'm not sure about that because he goes and gets his car and he says he's going to wait. I'm not sure. He may have actually been with Jennifer before he goes and sees Todd. Mm. Um, I do know that in the version, uh, the English version, the London version, um, mm -hmm. Terry is more specific 
about what happened or didn't happen with Jennifer. So um, I know we, we, we tried to make that a little more, um, not on the nose, but a little, just a little clearer as to, to what, what it actually, what actually happened. So it might be worth taking a look at that, that version at some point, yeah. just to give yourself a. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, we're trying to like dissect it. And it's like, he talks about Jennifer in the present tense. And then in the next tense, he talks about that she was, you know, a great, you know, girl. And so it's like, okay. Yeah. But yeah, that was one uh, question. And then um, just another small one. So each act starts with uh, each of the characters saying the words, go for it. And then subsequently the acts all end with Terry saying, sure. And uh, I love that word for Terry. It's, you know, he says it, I wager, you know, over 30 times. Um, and it's a great word of like compliance and, and just sort of a theme with him. Yeah. Wondering if there was any sort of, um, you know, deeper meaning to the different characters alternating saying that phrase at the top of each act. I think probably just in the writing of it again, not not just the keeping yourself entertained, but there was, I, I, I can be a little, um, not OCD, but, but a little, you know, um, precious or, that's not even necessarily right or fair, but I do like a sense of balance sometimes, you know, like something begins like it ends or, you know, once I saw that that, maybe I, I discovered that, oh, I'd written it again on, on scene two and I'm like, oh, well then I might as well do it on scene three and, you know, have that happen. And then I, I might as well have the scenes end with Terry doing, you know, that kind of thing I'm, I'm certainly capable of doing, of finding a, a rhythm to a whole structure as well as, the rhythm within the language of the characters. So I think it was more about that than it was about any kind of profound meaning within those words. It was really about the, just the balance of, of, of the, the scenes and, and, uh, and the way, and the way those, those things sounded on stage. Great. Okay. One last one. And then, uh, and then, yeah, Go okay. for it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, uh, okay. Uh, so there's ways, there's different ways to play it for Drew and Terry to set it up in the first act so that what Terry reveals in act three can be a, you know, huge, you know, shocking uh, reveal as to, you know, what happened to him um, and so on and so forth. And there's ways to play it so that it's not so much um, of a big turn and that people can kind of sort of see it coming. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, is, I don't know, is there a way that you prefer it to be? Well, obviously, you know, what I was, what I was talking about earlier is that um, I ultimately came to prefer having that information in the first scene. So, um, I'm not at all bothered by the fact that an audience may get a whiff of that. And I didn't think, I, I guess originally I, I imagined that they would, you know, uh, and, and certainly Drew comes forward at the end and says, look, man, that's, that's why I did it because I figured, you know, I'm such a dipshit and such a liar that you're going to see through most everything. And so the one soft spot that I thought you had one vulnerable thing is Todd. So I jumped on that and, and hope that would, would save my ass in this case. And it did. And uh, he might not know the extent of it. And he might not know that Terry has the feelings that he has and all that, but he's, I think he's pretty sure that what's happened happened. And uh, so um, I wasn't, it didn't bother me if, you know, I, I could have done a lot more work, to hide my tracks and have an audience not know that. So I think I, first time around, I, I kind of was okay with whoever, you know, thought, figured that out, figured it out. Um, the play ran 
you know, continuously. So there was no break. I, I wasn't worried about, oh, at an interval, they're going to like talk to each other and people are going to figure it out. And, you know, whereas when I did the shape of things, I was, I didn't want anybody like getting a whiff of what Evelyn was up to. And so I, beyond the fact that I just, you know, was able to, and I just wanted to do it. I played the music so loud. It was, the, I used Smashing Pumpkins uh, between all the scenes. Yeah. It was like ear splittingly loud. Yeah. And some people who came loved it and some people fucking hated it. And you could see them hating it. And occasionally someone would leave because <laughs> of it. But I actually even had a, a sound technician come in and say, how loud can we play this? and not be breaking any like codes. Like this is too loud for ears and you really shouldn't be doing this or, and then we just kind of played it right at that notch, wow. you know, because I didn't want people to even be able to in between scenes in the physical act of moving furniture around and shit like that. I didn't even want them to be able to lean over to their partner and go, what do you think that Evelyn is up to? And do you think Adam is, I didn't even, I just wanted to see a mouth going, <laughs> because this noise is so fucking loud that it was just like, and we just drive that play on and on and on and on. Um, and in the end, I was like, that's not enough. I don't, you know what? I don't even want a curtain call. Take the, you know what, guys? I talked these actors into a, like a no curtain call and they were like, yeah. come again? What? Ah! What are we, we're not doing a curtain call? Yeah. You know, and uh, so I was like, no, I, you know what? I, I don't want to, I just want the play just to land in their laps. Yeah. like it is and let them w go home and um i've never seen actors go to the bar so quickly in my <laughs> lifetime so as to get praise from others you know in the lobby before they went home but eventually i kicked in a, a curtain call we had a, a thing set up where uh the stage manager would roll some dice every night and if it landed on one three or five they got a curtain call and if it was two four or six they got no curtain call but until press night, I, uh, I, I was like, we, we can't have a curtain call. So they were okay with that because they eventually got one. But um, in this case, yeah, I didn't mind that, that people, you know, might be sniffing around that. And so when it came to this director saying to me, hey, what about if we move that information to the first scene? I was like, yeah, I think that actually makes sense. And it'll be even better. I think, you know, we'll have more as I said earlier, a, a greater sense of dread, of worry for this young lady. If we know Terry has walked in, you know, revealing this information and is now going to find this guy who has done this thing to him and his brother. So um, I'm totally okay with that. So you, you know, you, you do whatever strikes you. Uh, probably, like I said, be worth taking a look at that other version, just so you know where things have, have moved um, and that kind of clarification of the end. Um, but you can do the play without it. It's just more speculation on your part, which I don't mind either. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I thought, yeah, if, if, I thought one little tweak that would change a lot is that if you knew Terry's or Todd's nickname for Terry was Buddy in the first act. Just that little piece could kind of foreshadow some things and change. Well, now you're rewriting. What? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're talking a lot. To, yeah, yeah. But, cool. Thank you so much. For oh, this. pleasure. Yeah, good luck. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, that's great. Let's bring on the um, Maggie who's working on the Jennifer role, the young lady in the second act of In a Dark, Dark House. Maggie, are you still there? She's, she's in a Hollywood square with... Another yep, human. She's right. with Christian. Okay. There she is. Hi, Maggie. Yep, Maggie we're say hello to Neil. Neil, Maggie. Nice, nice, hey, Maggie. nice to meet. And uh, take it away. Um, well, like Skip, I have also been haunted by the question of these keys and what they mean. But I'm also going to resist this, the temptation to ask about them um, because I'm sure there's not a. I imagine there's not a concrete answer there, which I totally understand. Um, so instead, I wanted to ask, you know, Jennifer is such an interesting character and in that she 
balances this sort of budding sexuality, but also this naivete in a really fascinating way. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what sort of references you had when you were sort of formulating her voice, whether that be, you know, real life people that you knew or characters from other pieces, or if it just was a voice that sort of came to you um, and sort of how you developed that very specific um, young teenage voice that's so different from these older men in the piece. Yeah, um, I mean, that's, you know, the, 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 the balance of age is always such an interesting relationship, you know, especially if there's, there's anything that, that, that is turned toward romance or sexuality, you know, when there's, there's age between characters and, and what that is, is that okay? Is that okay? Do, can you, you know, talk about that? Is it, um, how does that play out as opposed to two people who are of a, a like age? Um, I mean, Lolita is an obvious example. Um, and if you ever want to want a great experience, there's a, a Random House uh, audio recording of, of Jeremy Irons, who, who made a film uh, of, of Lolita. He reads the book. Um, and uh, there's a preamble in the beginning of the book, which is sort of the editor who's talking about the, the, the manuscript. And then there's the beginning, the famous, you know, um, Lolita, Light of My Life, Fire of My Loins, that he sort of does a voice, you know, like playing a character when he reads the beginning. But if you start where the, you know, the, the novel kind of proper starts, I was listening to that one day and I, I and I don't do this often, I, I actually burst into tears uh, listening yeah. to his voice. Good. He's got... He's got a hell of a voice. Yeah. Um, and uh, it wasn't, you know, my, my feelings about the book, but it was just a, a beautiful rendition of that book that he does. Um, but um, it's really more like what you described there, that a person who's like on the edge of something, of just, you know, discovering things about themselves, always interesting, whether it's a young person who's, who's, kind of realizing the power that she has of, of just who she is. And, you know, that the, 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 the kind of brashness and immortality and stupidity of being younger, you know, where we think we're invincible and no one's ever going to do us wrong or, you know, everything's the most of this and the greatest of that and, and kind of being terrified and not afraid at the same time. And all the, those are really more of the things that I was trying to get a handle on, you know, and, and that's sort of the place where Terry, I think, finds himself frozen, you know, and I wanted to contrast that, that relationship with his brother, that difficult thing that we can have with a sibling and, and, uh, and a closeness and a distance at the same time. And then this person that he doesn't know, but they're actually kind of maybe even on the same emotional level, you know, that, that he was frozen in a place by his experiences that he, when he's with her, it's suddenly like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm 15 again. Yes. Just, I'm just here and having fun and playing. And, you know, it for, kind of forgets that he's the age that he is and, and, and what's going on and what he really came for. And, and those moments really kind of make me sad and happy and, you know, for that guy. Mm -hmm. um because that that character is uh is is one that is he he's kind of an interesting one to me um why he does what he does and what does he do and um and and why he still can find it in himself to like try and help this fool of a brother of his um who i feel sorry for too you know i mean this, the, these guys are are you know little kids in the end, um, just hurt, hurt boys. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been, I've written a lot of hurt boys, you know, but a lot of them mask that in shit that doesn't make them feel like hurt boys. Mm -hmm. They feel like big fucking annoying douchebags, yeah. um, loud and brash and scary and, you know, all kinds of things. But uh, many of them, you peel it back. They're, they're just, you know, kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's why I think I'm the most successful actors at playing a lot of the stuff that I've done, humanize these words on the page by being people, you know, that we can look at and we go, oh yeah, when I read that, 
I thought, man, this is just like, ah, cold and like irredeemable. And, but then somebody stands up there and I look in their eyes and, you know, they're just, you know, there are very few monsters in the end, you know, yeah. even, you know, totally. the, the best Iagos I've seen somehow those son of a bitches make me care about them. Yeah. You know, or Richard, not or, mm -hmm. all the way through, but there's glimpses there where I realized that that's just all human stuff, just jealousy. And, you know, so in the end, monsters aren't that exciting to play. They're a little, you know, that's why zombies after a while, it just gets a little repetitive. You know, you have to, you have to worry about the people, you know, who are, who are running from the zombies who, when, when they're the ones who can keep, you know, making interesting and scary and weird choices. So I guess that was part of it for her was, you know, less one specific person and more about man or woman, boy or girl, that, that place where we find ourselves inexplicably having a hold over someone and being kind of shit scared at the same time of, of the, the place you found yourself, you know, in the middle of nowhere with, uh, you know, with this adult who could, who could do you harm. Um, that's a, a, I hope an interesting place to, to, you know, be as an actor. Uh, I think it's good to be scared on stage. I think it's good to, you know, not be scared that you don't know your lines, uh, mm -hmm. not be scared of, you know, of, of falling down, but of being in a place where you're, you're letting us in and letting us, you know, see you at your, at your most vulnerable and, and freest. So um, I guess that, that was really more of, of where I was coming at, you know, that, that age and that experience and that lack of experience and all those things. And, and, and this, you know, kind of power that, that, uh, that you can't really put a finger on. And yet, and it's, it's just there. We let it be there, I guess. We, it's just, it happens. And uh, so I'm glad I, if you're having fun, you know, playing with it, I hope it's, I hope it's a good experience. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love everything you're saying. And I, I think that's what makes the scene so fun is Skip and I have talked a lot about it, how, you know, in, it could be read one way and you could think that elements of it are creepy. And then in another way, it's just like a dark love story and sort of the duality of both of those angles existing at the same time makes it so exciting. Great. Well, I hope it's, I hope you guys have a good, a good dance. Yeah. Wow. So this is just so rich. And, and Drew is being played by Jason. Jason, you had a question too. Jason, are you there in a dark, dark house? Jason, meet Neil. Neil, meet Jason. Can you see Jason? Hey, Jason, yeah. Okay, yeah, he's playing the, the Drew character. Did you have, yeah, take it away, Jason. Hi, Neil. How are you? I'm great, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, coming to talk to us. Um, and really, thank you for putting all that you do into your work. It's... Uh, it's palpable. Um, so been working on this play for a while and something that struck me in your preface to the play, uh, you mentioned that this particular play hit a little bit closer to home, yeah. maybe uh, more of a challenge in that way. Um, although, you know, it's packed with fiction, active imagination being put in there uh, but there was that, you mentioned that kernel of truth uh, growing up in a dark house. Um, you touch on, you know, you understand what the brothers in some ways are what they're going through and and the father figure in the house. Um, I get, my, my question is, when you were putting this story onto the page and you're formulating the story was the idea of this to have this be an experience where it's just, you know, I'm just bearing my soul and the audience is going to see this story and there it is. Or is there something that you want the audience to take away from this story when watching it? it what would a takeaway be if that's true a theme or something that you would want the audience to take away from this story 
Well, I, no, uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, if I, if I was, if it was like my story more completely, I think I would have just embraced that, you know, and, and, and written it in that, in that way. Um, but you always, there's always, yeah, sure. You don't want people to take something away. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's so much entertainment out there today. There's so much fast, you know, we, we can consume that, um, we just move from one to the next, to the next, to the next. The idea that somebody might sit with these things and thoughts and themes and uh, talk about it for an evening or, you know, a week from then, great. Um, but in the end, you're just trying to tell a good story. You know, it's, that is my, the, the uh, currency that, that I'm, I'm operating on with people is I've, I've made this, uh, this pact of, I'm going to take up a couple hours of your time and, uh, and you have chosen to, to give me that opportunity. So I had better, you know, sit you down and tell you a good story when you haven't uh, heard or a version of that you haven't heard before. Um, there's, I mean, there's, you can find how many stories of abuse can you, can you find out there in, in whatever medium you want. So writing this late in the, in the continuum of, of world dramatic history, uh, one finds oneself at a disadvantage. You know, there's so many stories have been written. So many things have been said and told. So I have to, I've written a number of relationship pieces. You know, it's like here, I'm going to, I'm going to tell another story about boy meets girl, girl meets boy, girl meets girl. I better have something to say, you know, or, or very quickly, probably people will move on from this. So um, that's the, that's the decision I have to make each time is what story am I going to tell that I think is actually compelling enough for someone to sit down and, you know, read it, embrace it, watch it, you know, whatever medium it's on. Um, uh, so I, I, I have to hope that in sort of in a general way that, that that's what I'm doing is telling a good story. Uh, I, I, I felt like I hadn't the angle that I was I was approaching with Terry at least um, the notion of somebody who felt like what now people his brother other people would consider as an abusive relationship that he's gone through is the thing that he finds was at least until this moment was the the closest relationship he felt like he'd had, the most loving relationship. Um, I remember the director talking to me, the original director of, of the play, saying that 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 was worrisome to her, that that people were going to, you know, really examine it in a way, um, not that it wouldn't hold up, but that it was, um, it would be scrutinized in a particular way if I was going to say that, Terry actually felt like that was was a a positive thing in his life. What had happened that that's 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 not something that people would want to hear. That mm -hmm. they would want to to accept that notion. Um, and it wasn't you know without some research. Not me sitting in a a library, you know, looking through through documents, but but having I spent a lot of time. When I was a younger man, um, as opposed to a younger woman, uh, I, I was I've been a man this whole time. Um, I I worked in in a number of uh, psych hospitals, psych facilities. You know, not all hospitals, but but some group homes and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, everything from a state hospital to so again, the world I I could speak with some authority about the you know the the realm of the of the world that i was talking about not it, again it wasn't like a documentary it wasn't like i, I got to tell this particular tale about something that happened in 1963 no i i was able to speak to to the the kind of experiences that these people might have had um so uh i knew that i wasn't you know I wasn't making making things up. I wasn't it wasn't science fiction. It was it was possible that a person could have that reaction. Yeah. And uh, and so it felt like okay, that's that's ground that I haven't seen 
walked on as, as often. And so therefore that's interesting to me mm -hmm. as a, as a writer and as a, you know, someone trying to tell you a story. Um, so that's more the world I was in rather than I got to be true to this, this thing that happened in our family or mm -hmm. in somebody else's family or a story I had heard about, you know, like that it was, it wasn't the case, but in terms of the world that, that those people came from all that, I, I, I had I had lived some portion of that and um, and so I felt like I could I could get into the you know the skin of those people and of course the job for me is whether it's a, a world I know or not if I choose to talk about that world I've got to make it feel as if I, I know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it just happens to be easier than others because you you have that experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or or a kind of experience you know in that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Jason. And thank I think you, Neil. That, Neil. Yeah. you know, and it's and that play in particular, you know, all I don't think anyone writes with, lands bombs and explosions and electricity the way that you do, Neil. So across the board, that's you know, you you're there's mastery in that area for you, and and this particular play we've been talking about it so much in, inside of what Jason was talking about too like the impact you know that that play you know because you took us into a dark dark house that was so specific and explored explored you know so um ideas of you know sexual abuse being carried on from generation to generation or domestic abuse or just violence in general being passed down um let's say you know even from terry's generation to jennifer's generation you know that it keeps being perpetuated i mean the, encoded and and really right there in the play um it, you know are, are are things that and issues that so many people are are dealing with and in fact this pr the production that we want to that uh, we're going to do for the showcase is we're coupling with one in six, which is a men's organization, men that have been abused, uh, violent abuse, sexual abuse um, in their childhood. And it's an organization that um, is um, uh, a place where they can, um, there are programs for them and rehabilitations for, for men that have gone through that. And all that to say, um, when I first read that play and when we first started working on the play, uh, very intense rehearsals, very um, deep, deep gutting conversations, very vulnerable, open, raw communications, you know, with myself, the actors and uh, among the actors. Um, and at the end of the day, I was always left with, in terms of what Jason was talking about, like the impact that it had on me personally, watching the play in, in rehearsals was, you know, I felt like less alone. I just felt less alone. And I, and my assertion was that people seeing in a dark, dark house would also feel less alone inside of, you know, traumas or things that they had experienced or dealt mm. with or gone through or been through or survived or um, survived and triumphed through. So, um, yeah. And, and um, so that's something that's been, um, and also we started really working on this during the pandemic and before the pandemic and that, you know, during this time, this past year or so people's hearts are breaking all over the place and the difficulty and the struggles and that have been going on are just yeah, rampant sure. around the world. And it was really such a, it's been a phenomenal process to work in your words and your worlds and in a dark, dark house and all your other plays and have a place where we can put all of these, have a place to explore and express these feelings, these hurts, these pains, these triumphs. And um, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah. And, and we're, we're, we do feel um, a kind of as gutting as the play is, and as awful as the play is, we feel kind of that, you know, in the same way that I had the experience of feeling like, oh, someone on that stage is talking about, like, I, I get, I, someone understand, I felt more understood after reading that play in a dark, dark house, somehow. I felt like I was understood. And I just, when I, being, being in that play and working on that play, I am hopeful that people watching it will also feel less alone out there in the dark. So, um, yeah, so 
Anyway, thank you. I, you. You guys are the luckiest actors on the whole planet of eight, almost eight billion people to have the, I can't even, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm jealous of you, but I'm here with you while the writer's here. So it's fantastic. Okay. Um, we're going to, we have a few more, do you need a, we have a few more questions actually about the break of noon. Do you need a bio break, Neil? We can pause this, take a bio break. No, I'm okay. good. Whatever. Okay? We, I mean, if you usually take a break, take a break and we can come back or whatever. Uh, if you're good, but you, t you tell me. Um, sure, fantastic. Everybody needs a break. Go ahead, take a break. No, no, no. Well, I'm, I'm good. I just wanted to make sure if you need to handle any, you know, I don't know. Bio breaks, whatever people do on bio breaks, but if you're good. Okay. I, don't, I don't even know what that term is. I don't even, I don't even know. Uh, a, bi a bio break, a biological break for oh, bio. Oh, I see. Okay. That was kind of okay. No, I'm good. I'm, yeah, I'm, okay. good in the, I'm good in the bio. Okay, you're good in the bio. Fabulous. Thank you. All right. So we were going to... Um, Perfect. Madison, you had a question. You're not working on in a doctor's yes. house right now. You are working on no. Fat Pig. Um, Madison is working yes. on Fat Pig. Madison, meet Neil. Yes. Neil, meet Madison. Take it away. Hi, Madison. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm good. good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing all right. Thank um, so I just have a very quick question. Sure. Are there tools that you picked up along the way when you're writing to get you in the zone? Or is it just like a happy accident that you kind of stumble into? Um, you know what? I generally, I would say be you know be good. To, are you are you a writer as well? Um, mm -hmm. I say be good to yourself. You know what I mean? Like I said before, I'm, I feel like I'm always writing. You know, like I carry things around in my head, and and so mm -hmm. I, I write in my head a lot. You know, and then when I, I I I've now gotten to a place where again I'm I'm breaking them up between like I owe somebody something and I'm, I'm, I have to write this for a deadline or that sort of thing. And this is yeah. just something I want to work on on my own. I'm talking about that, that kind of thing. Even, even in the other sense, I, you know what? I, I kind of put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, whatever, um, when I'm ready to go. I, I hate to just sit there and stare at the screen and think, what am I going to write now? And, uh, hey, let's try and be funny. You know, shit like that is just really not detrimental, but it's just, it's kind of counterproductive. And so I'd rather come in knowing it's like, hey, I'm ready to write and sit down and, and start writing. I feel like more pages come from that. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like, here's a writing exercise or doing a prompt, or, all those things. If something gets you to write, that's great. If, there's, if it's music or no music or, you know, I used to, when I was a student, I was like, there was a, a sort of like storage room in the place that I lived in, you know, part of a, in the, you know, the, the eve of a, a, the top floor where they, they can't make a proper room out of it because the, the slant of the roof is. And so they use, use that for storage. I found that, okay, I can't even stand up in this room, but I'm going to push a desk into there straight against that white wall and, and not have any distractions of open windows or people talking or, and I would go in and close that door until I sort of felt like, oh, the air is running out in here. <laughs> I'm like, it's now too hot and I can't really breathe. But I would like just, I just kind of needed to zone things out. You know, it was the opposite of like going to Starbucks, which some people love to go sit at Starbucks and write, God bless, I can't do it. So I, you know, wanted just that distraction free, here's my little world, I'll paint the walls, whatever color I want to paint them, you know, I don't mean literally, but I'm going to paint them with the world that I'm creating. Um, so whatever that thing is that makes you comfortable, that cup of coffee or, you know, listening to somebody else talking or singing or, you know, jazz or whatever the fuck it is, why wouldn't you do that? You know, in the same way, like whatever your warm up is for acting, mm -hmm. um, some people's warm up is 30 minutes. And some people, as I said, walk on stage and off they go. As long as it's not interrupting anybody else's process, go for it. I don't care, really, as long as it works for you and you do that thing that I know you can do and I want you to do. You know, if you come hustling in off the street and I'm, oh, I'm late and I'm, you know, often your stage manager is going to be the one who's like, you should be here 30 minutes, you know, whatever. Great. But if you as an actor don't need all that time, do what you got to do as a writer. If you need to like, just go, it's, it's, it's a process. It's, you know, it, I keep those muscles moving. I need to write a couple pages every day just to write. And if I, don't throw any, I was about to say, if you throw them away, throw them, don't throw anything away. Because you never know. A year from now, that silly little monologue that you wrote ends up the basis for 
you know, a show or a play or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, why toss your, your work out? But it may not be come to fruition for a while. But you just, yeah. you, you kind of have to find that thing. There's no, I, I guess the secret is there's, there's no secret, you know? Yeah. The, the, uh, the gift I can give you is to know that you have to find your own way up the mountain. We all do, you know? You okay. can you can go to the same school I went to and you can read the same books I've done and or read and we're not going to write the same thing, you know? We, you know, And it's no assurance that anybody's ever going to produce your plays. And I could have gone to a, a bigger you know, more expensive school, no school at all. The, the beauty of writing is that, you know, up to a point, you can be whoever you are. You can do whatever else you do. You can you can work at an embassy. You can, you know, be in prison. You can do, you know, people have written amazing books in prison. You know, if you want to write, you just have to carve out some time to do it. You have to write. You have to, you know, check off wrote one of the most astounding lessons to another writer that I ever read in a letter that he wrote to Maxim Gorky, who was a younger writer who wrote to him basically saying, you know, any ways to, to, you know, help me write and, and Chekhov wrote three words back to him. He wrote, write, write, write. Okay. There's no, there's no, nothing was beyond that. It's just like, you just need to do it. You can talk about it. You can, Think about it. You can fool around with it, but there's only one way that you're going to get a stack of pages on the table, and that is to write them. And so <laughs> okay. that's, that's the best thing I can give you. And, and it's, it's also the good news that yeah. you don't have to follow anybody else's trail. Right. You know, there is that mountain that we all have to get to the top of, but there are many ways to the top, and you just have to find the one that suits you best. And it probably won't be the same one every time is what you will find. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. That was blah, blah, blah. I hope that I hope that was useful. <laughs> yes, it was. It was. It's so great, and it's so freeing to know that there no two paths have ever been alike, and they never will be. You know, on the creative mm-hmm. journey, and it's very freeing because you're not under some constraint like it has to look some certain way. It's it's all inside of a, a creation and being called and pulled into the career of your dreams of your creation. So great question. Thanks, Madison. All right. Well, we'll toggle. We're going to toggle back over to um, uh, Bre- Brendan, who is what are we gonna do? Bre- we're going to toggle over to oh, okay. what's, the, what's toggling toggle is like a bio break without the biology. Um, it's um, toggle. A toggle is kind of like a, a zoom term for like this Hollywood square versus that Hollywood square. Oh, I see. Okay. Toggle. We're toggling over to another Hollywood. Right, go toggle. Well, we used to call this moving over to we're now toggling over. Okay, got it. Toggling over. Oh, good. Brendan, I mean, Brendan is um, actually he's going to be doing some, um, he's uh, working on Fat Pig in a, a scene study class, working on the toggle, okay. and also going to be doing some narration when we showcase the break of noon. So, in that as well, and, uh, and stage managing and all the things. Take it away. Oh, wow. Lots of stuff. Yeah, lots, lots of stuff. Lots of things. Um, a, I actually really appreciated that answer to Madison's question. I thought that was, as someone who's coming into creative arts a little bit later in life, like I really resonated with me in a lot of ways. So well, that's, yeah, you know, it's never too late. That's the good news is that, you know, I mean, again, until it is, but, you know, until then, it's never too late. You know, if you create one one good thing, you, you, you are... Oh, and uh, let me, I'm going to jump back to, to Madison for just one second because uh, I just saw a really good movie about the creative process. And, and I say good rather than great because I thought in the last third it stumbled a little. Um, but there's an Italian film uh, that came out maybe last year uh, based on a Jack London novel called Martin Eden. Um, and it's a really, it's shot beautifully looks like it was made in the seventies on 16 millimeter or something. Fantastic looking. Um, great performance by this, this young actor. He won the, uh, the, the top prize at Venice a couple a year ago or so. Um, but it's all about a guy who comes from very humble origins, who wants to become a writer and uh, the ordeal that he goes through to, uh, to become and sort of a be careful what you wish for 
Uh, so it was a it was a, it was an interesting uh, and very. I, I try and watch something every day that's you know better than than anything I've I've ever worked on. And weirdly, I managed to find something every single day that I consider better than what I've done. So, but it's uh, you know it's the best way, it's the best way to learn. I started out in the public libraries reading anything thing I get my hands on, and I'm still you know doing that or cruising bookstores or, you know, going to the movies every day or whatever I can do to, to see other good stuff. Um, so that's a, that's a movie that's, that's worth, I think, seeing for both the performance and just the world of, of creating. Um, but um, yeah, it's, you know, he's, he started late too and, and other people start even later and, and younger and burn out by the time they're, you know, 20. So it's a, uh, it's sort of a race without being a race. Um, right. You know, it's a race with yourself. So mm. everyone's got their own path, so I imagine. Brandon, you look about 18 years old. So you are you look like a spring chicken anyway. So don't sweat it. Okay. <laughs> I will not sweat it. Uh, thank you. Um, well, my question, Neil, is, you know, you do a, a really excellent job, you know, navigating these nooks and crannies of life and kind of exploring these parts of life that I think a lot of people are afraid to kind of even experience, like even wade in the waters to kind of, you know, there's an apprehension to it. And I just imagine, you know, when you were kind of coming through and you, you go through these processes, did you ever find a piece of humanity that you had a hard time putting onto the page? Or, or did you found tricky is probably a better word to learning how to kind of, um, yeah, just how to translate it. Sure. I mean, everything's, everything's tricky. You know, it's, 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 it's all just kind of how you end up doing it. Um, you can, I think I've always felt like you can approach any subject. Some people disagree. There are subjects they'd prefer not to or prefer not to see. Um, but that's them. And, and for me, it's, I think you can tackle almost anything, anything actually. Um, it's just kind of how you do it. Mm. Um, and I've certainly written about more than I've ever experienced, but I've experienced it that way. You know, I've tried to approach it just as um, how would this how would this unfold um, if if I were living it rather than than just writing it. Uh, and I have to believe, I want to believe that you know writers can write outside their their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's. Um, in the end, you just have to be, just try and be as honest as possible. I'm probably more honest on paper than I am as a person, I think, or used to be. And I've gotten to be, you know, it, it's helped me become more and more open and honest um, as a person. Um, I grew up in a, in a family that, you know, on both sides, both parents, you know, used, used um, lies sometimes to you know, um, keep themselves safe, or to to do things that uh, they wanted to do at the you know at the expense of other people, and and so you know um, you you learn a lot when you're young. You know, you, you and they're 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 hard won things, and and they're hard to give up sometimes. And so you know, you you those those kind of gut reactions you have to experiences that are like, oh wow, you know, I got to protect myself at all costs. Um, so it's, I, I just kind of always tried to make the page a place where I could be as honest as possible, you know, even if it's a fictional world, you know, the, the emotions and the, the things you're talking about were approached in an honest way or, um, with an openness that, that you might not always feel in your own life. But I think it's it's actually helped me to to become more of that kind of person as well. Um, but I'm you know I, I I do think that you could just it's good to know you know how you how you, what your limits are and 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 what you you know feel like you you can and can't do. Uh, but for me, I, I do feel like there's almost nothing that I, I wouldn't or would be afraid to tackle. It's yeah. just I would want to know that I could I could approach it in the in the best and most honest way. Um, 
And that might hold you back on certain things. Think feeling like, oh, I don't have enough authority for that or don't know enough about it or, you know, things like that. But um, I, don't, I don't have much fear in terms of this, this can be talked about or can't be talked about or that, that sort of thing. I mean, this is the place. This is the, the place to do that. Um, sometimes more so than, than in reality with people, that this is the, the, the most direct or easiest conduit for, for people to accept and to, uh, you know, sit in the dark and watch a story and, and uh, have a reaction to that rather than you looking them in the eye and telling them the same information. So um, it's, a, it's a powerful tool when used correctly you know, the, the theater or, or film. Um, it's a powerful tool when used incorrectly as well. So uh, it, it cuts both ways. But um, uh, I guess who am I to say, which is, is correct and incorrect, but it's just as far as what, I'm, what I feel. I got you. Thank you very much. That's My brilliant. Pleasure. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and us actors, uh, uh, you know, we get to feel and experience and get to know parts of ourselves that we wouldn't be able to without mm-hmm. your daring to write about those parts and those places in our humanity so wow wow okay all right we're going deep we're gonna get we're gonna go even deeper let's see patty you had a question patty come on uh screen can you wave patty there you are patty so patty's working on um the break of noon right now she's working on the jesse character in the break of noon and uh patty meet neil neil meet patty patty hey patty Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for for this tonight. Oh, thank you. I have so many questions, but let me try and keep it to one. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair. Um, going back to your upbringing and 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 knowing that you came from non arts. Don't know, make me cry. Background. Don't start um, sounding like Jeremy Irons. <laughs> and. How did you come to this, to where you are now? Like this path, what was the path? Like what? Oh, uh, yeah, just, okay, that, that's a fair question. Um, yeah. and, do you have more? Is that it? Well, just how did you know that this is, I can do this? Because that wasn't your... Yeah, I, um, no, it certainly wasn't a family business. Um, my father was a truck driver. Um, my mom was a housewife until it became uh, important for her to work, I think, at the time, I felt like from a financial standpoint, but also I think from an emotional standpoint, she probably needed to get out of the house and, and work and that sort of thing. So, um, so I grew up, you know, as I think I said, working on a farm. We didn't own the farm, but we, um, I worked on this this uh, this farm that my father um, tended to in his in his off time. And uh, so it was very, yeah, blue collar world, you know, went to the movies a lot, watched TV as much as I could, uh, loved, you know, escaping into other worlds. Uh, my mom was a, a voracious reader, uh, not of a necessarily great literature, but um, of stories. You know, she read every pocket book she could, I should always call them a pocket book to, to the end of her life. Um, and, you know, uh, had one in her purse and, you know, read them and, and then tossed them, you know, into a pile on the other side of her bed and started in on something new. And, and so she was a, you know, a, a reader and took me to the public library a lot. And I would check out as many books as I could check out on my card and, and read those and, you know, escape into other worlds. Loved, loved being in some world other than the one I was in. Um, and so I think that translated into writing. You know, I, I then started tinkering with, with trying to tell stories myself. And um, uh, drama theater came later. Um, you know, I really had very few um, examples. Great, uh, not the opposite of great, very little access to, you know, some community theater, some stuff at school church occasionally you know, there was like a community church that that we went to i went to just to hang out with other kids and get out of the house and you know that sort of thing um which i'm sure you know whatever religious deity there is is very appreciative that that's how i was using the opportunity was a chance to get out of the house um but if it is a true religious deed i think they would understand so um and they would be they would you know give me give me grace on that but um 
it was, you know, from, from whatever things I saw, I, there was something about that live experience of seeing people, you know, telling you a story now in front of you and they were tangibly there. And, and, uh, I, um, you know, what else happened? I had an older brother and he, um, he went to school locally and he would take me to a high school play or to a college play. I remember seeing, I saw like King Lear, uh, at his college when I was, I was young. He took me to it because he was like, he knew I liked this stuff. And he didn't even stay. He like dropped me off and like went to the library and was like, go watch your stupid play. And, um, How'd you, like of, it? How'd you like kind it? Of fell with it? I loved it. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, you know, so probably didn't, you know, at the time understand much of what was going on. I mean, right. the basic story, you know, I liked it when the eyes got gouged out, shit like right. that. I you played know. that role. Regan, I got to gouge the eyes out. Yeah. Out vial jelly. I mean, I never forgot that line. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was probably a 25 year old King Lear in kabuki makeup. <laughs> you know, if I saw it now, I'd be like, who the fuck thought I was going to fall for that. And of course I did. I, the magic of it, you know, I fell in love with. So um, it's just, you know, there's, it, there's that, is that, was that the production? I don't know. Um, I didn't see Ian McKellen do something. I wasn't, you know, it was, it was just a, a general falling in love with, with that thing of, of being told a story. And that seemed like the most immediate version of it. You know, the fact that it could Something could go wrong. Something, you know, um, that made it different than watching a film. You know, I could go to a film three times in a week. I, I, I have done that in my past. In my reckless youth, I've gone to the same movie, you know, three or four times. Um, and, you know, it's the same damn movie, you know, it's every time. And, and you love it and all that stuff, but it doesn't really change much. Um, but the theaters, that's what's, again, so maddening about it and yet so perfect is that it's, you know, it's Quicksilver and you you were lucky enough to be in the audience that night and saw that show that nobody else will ever see, you know, no matter how many times people go see it or some version of it. Um, so, I mean, those things are kind of, you know, everyday practical magic, you know, miracles that uh, you can actually you know, hold on to and kind of believe in rather than, so it sort of becomes your religion, I guess, you know, in a, in a way you just, you need another hit of that thing because you, uh, you find something in it that you don't find anywhere else. So, yeah. um, mm -hmm. a pretty, you know, common version of, you know, a story you've probably heard in other ways, but you know, the public library was, was the, the kind of the first, island that I crashed on was was that um, you know being able to, to hold a book in your hand and 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 read it and and uh, or go out and buy it and have that thing on your shelf and pull it down and you know open it up and that story spills out and so that that all that was very kind of great you know and outside of what my normal experience was you know was the rest of it was cleaning cow shit and uh, run in the fields and going to school and, you know, doing shit like that. So uh, there was something about that that was great, but there was also, I was just drawn more and more to sitting in front of the television and going to the movies and reading books and that sort of thing. And uh, I knew there was something in there that I wanted to do. And, and that you asked about that moment, the moment that I thought I could do this professionally, I can remember um, like the first time I went to London as a student, you know, when I sat and I, I saw, geez, I, I don't remember who I saw on that trip. I saw Vanessa Redgrave and I saw Brian Cox and I saw, you know, all these people doing this shit. And I was like, <laughs> you know, when, when I could actually see them, because I was so far up in the galleries that, you know, Vanessa Redgrave could have been Brian Cox for all I know. <laughs> you know, it was like so far away, these yeah. tickets that I, I was buying. Um, but, you know, some smaller venues as well and seeing Ian Holm on stage and, you know, shit that we were like, wow, this is just, this is too much. I just, you know, I'm, I'm intoxicated and I'm, I'm overwhelmed and I'm, I'm, you know, feeling uh, a lot of stuff, but, 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 you know, not put off, but like, I can never, you know, 
finish that sentence. And then another trip when I was in, in college, uh, grad school at this point, and I got a fellowship to, uh, to England to, to, to uh, a theater. And I was, I was working there and I started going to other plays and stuff. And then suddenly the veil parted a little bit, you know, and I was watching these actors and I was listening to these plays and I was seeing things in rehearsal mm -hmm. and they lost a little bit. That's, you know, it's both good and, and bad. It's a little, you know, it's a, a little sad as well because it's like once you start working in television and making movies, you never quite watch them the same way again. You know, <laughs> right. a little, you know, it's like seeing Oz, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, you see behind the curtain and, and it's hard to, and you now kind of have to watch somebody else watching them and see that look, you know, like the kid in Cinema Paradiso. Yes. Like, that look on your face of, you know, when it's, when it's still magic. But for me, it was great because that veil dropped and I looked at those people and I was like, I can remember walking out on the street and going, I don't know what show it was. It might've, it might've been, I don't know what it was. Um, but I walked out on the street and I was like, I can do that. Mm. And suddenly they were, you know, on my level as it were, you know, mm -hmm. it, there may be levels to that level, but mm -hmm. they were real people and they were, you know, not gods anymore. They were like, I was like, oh, that's a profession. That's a job. <laughs> They're doing a job. And yeah, no, I can do that. I can, I can, I can write like that. Wow. I can, I can, you know, I can, I can put on something like this. And yeah, I never looked back from that. Once I knew that I could do it, the whole goal changed to, I need to do it. Wow. As opposed to, can I? The best thing you can erase from your vocabulary as an actor or a writer as a director is if. If I get a chance, if I, will I, will this happen? If I do, when will it happen? If, actually, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What am I saying? Delete that word. We could we can delete that word. Yeah, that's the word. It's, the same it's a matter of when, not a matter of if. Yeah. You have to leave no room for that. The more doubt you can foster, the harder this this the struggle will be. Mm -hmm. I you know, I could have dropped away from what I was doing many, many times, done another job, mm -hmm. did a lot of education, I could teach. But I knew there was something else I wanted to do. And it was a matter of when and I'm not if. I removed if from the equation and I was ready for when, when came about. So when that opportunity presented itself, I had a script. I was ready to go. I did my thing and one thing led to another. So as much doubt, self and otherwise, as you can remove... I think the better off you'll be. So, so. Well, I have no sense of if that answered so your question. It's so, it's so, yeah, beyond, beyond. It's so brilliant because um, it also speaks to, you know, as an, as an artist, as a writer, as an actor, <laughs> unless you are, have some semblance of being sound here psychologically, such that you can use your mind to empower yourself rather than disempower. I mean, that can, in the end, take you the distance in terms yeah. of, you know, achieving what you want to do creatively. Um, I, I love that. Just sort of taking certain... You won't, you won't do everything, but you really, you, you know, you just got to, you got to, as I said before, you got to be good to yourself. You got to, you got to remove yeah. that stuff. Everybody else will question everything. Yeah. You know, your motives, your, your talent, everything. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you write, whatever you act. So you have to protect that thing that you, yeah. you believe in. You yeah, know, you got to just keep believing in it. So it's as simple and, and hard as, as that. Simple as hard. Yeah, simple and as hard as that. That's so great. And I know all of us here in the stands listening to your story, like are vibrating with the recognition of like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing that play. And, you know, I, I was taken to, to uh, my parents after what Guys and Dolls, the musical when I was six years old at the Kennedy Center. 
And they said, do you want to go to the stage door? And I was like, what's a stage door? And they said, that's where the actors come out, you know? And it was at six when I, when they, they took me to the stage door at the Kennedy center and they started shuffling out in their jeans and their makeup was still on. And, you know, they were, they were going home to like eat dinner. And in that moment I was like, yeah, th this is a job. You can do this as a profession. Like this is a job, right? Cause they were, you know, the gods and goddesses before that. But, um, that's that's wild. That's wild. So um, but we virtually have the same experience at yeah. six and like you know twenty six. Yeah. So that's and great. King Lear versus Guys and Dolls, the musical. Yeah. But basically, front of the thing. hand, back of the they hand. They probably were wearing the same makeup. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, From what you described, exactly the same. So uh, Kabuki, that's so great. Thank you, Patty. Well, we have uh, a couple more questions. Let's see. Um, oh, Kate. Kate is in the house. Kate is sitting next to Sean. She's in a Hollywood Square with Sean. Sean. Sean is actually working on the lawyer in The Break of Noon. Kate is working on both the ginger roll in The Break of Noon, as well as uh, Jesse in The Break of Noon. Kate, uh, Kate had a question. Take it away, Kate. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. And hi. Thank you for your time and for oh. offering us your insight. My question for you, and if this is too uh, personal or thorny, just uh, give me the finger and I'll hand it over to him. The yeah. actual finger? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, um, fair enough. But, well, I was curious. I think uh, Robin had mentioned that, that you uh, had a, a bit of a complicated background with uh, the church, with religion. And since we hmm. are at the break of noon, I, I couldn't help but wonder how your background with religion had informed your approach to writing the play. Um, well, I mean, I guess everything informs everything, you know, if, yeah. whatever, you, whatever you are, you, you, you approach it from a, a particular angle and there's, there's infinite number of, of angles. Um, so yeah, no doubt everything that I was up to that point um, informed it, you know, along with every other part of me, but in terms of uh, the, the, um, my religious background, yeah, I started out in a, you know, um, non-denominational church and and uh and sort of did that as i as i said really not recreationally but but in a way yeah to to make friends and, and hang out with people and go to camp as much as you know go to uh listen to a sermon so um it was all kind of like a way to 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 get out of the house be away from the the family that i was you know um growing up with and and you know that that ride being rough. You look for a, a less rough ride. So I, I spent as much time at school or out of the house or even cleaning barns. Um, you know, doing whatever it was to to kind of not be there. Um, so uh, then I got a um, after high school. I got a a scholarship to go to Brigham Young University without being a, a Mormon. I was uh, I was offered a scholarship there. They, they, I guess they give out a certain number of them to non-members um, of the church, and uh, uh, with my limited means and and the fact that it was in another state, it all sounded great. <laughs> and I was like, "Let's get out of Dodge and, and go to Utah." Go, go to Utah because wow. um, Utah was like, I don't know what Utah is. Let's go. I've never been. <laughs> And um, there's a whole vastly different group of people than I was used to being around. Not that there were some Mormons, obviously, in, in the school that I went to. And so a lot of them were in theater. And so I knew that world somewhat, but not in any kind of like actual religious way. Um, and then I was, you know, suddenly thrust into this world where it's, you know, 97% Mormon and um, had to take religious classes and all kinds of things. Um so, you know, I, I, uh, I took a while to, to adjust to, to that and, um, and to adjust my, and then, you know, there was a lot of stuff that you couldn't do. You can't do this and you sign this and there's a dress code of this. And so, and I, and I just had grown up with enough authority that I really had a growing dislike for authority. And so I found myself pushing against most of those barriers. Um, but at the same time, you know, meeting a lot of good people and, and, uh, and, you know, again, it became more of like, I joined the church probably out of fellowship of, you know, being around people mm -hmm. than I did having, you know, an interest in the actual doctrine itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just had nothing but more growing questions about the church. And the more that people were like, 
well, you know, this, you know, we do. We, it's a matter of faith, and we. The more someone doesn't answer something, the more I smell, you know, <laughs> trouble. So I. Um, and then the more I was beginning to blossom as a writer and stuff that I wanted to write, you know, for a long time, I just, I, I kind of had to um, lie to myself. You know, I kind of had to, I, I was, I was balancing this thing where it was like, well, the church is asking you not to go to R rated movies. Not only are you going with abandon to R rated movies, you are making now making R rated movies. So, you know, I was just justifying that as, as fast as I could spin that logic um, but at some point, you, you just have to kind of look at yourself and say, yeah, well, you just, you know, you just, let's be honest, you're just lying to yourself. You just, you just, you're making it okay. Um, and at some point, I just had to make a choice. I had to either, you know, be a bad, what would be in quotes, a bad Mormon or not a Mormon. So I just stopped being one, you know, and, um, but like, like officially, like, you know, have my name removed from the records and, and that kind of thing. Um so a bona fide bad one. Um, and um, so by the time I got to writing Break of Noon, I was really writing about, I wasn't writing about, you know, whereas I'd written a play called Bash, which actually had Mormon characters in it, I, I did not base Break of Noon on any particular religion or figure, or it was just the notion of someone having an experience that led them to, actually having or believing they've had, uh, you know, uh, a connection with, with this um, religious entity. And um, so could I have written the same play? Probably not exactly the same, but I think I probably could have written a play very similar had I not had any of those previous religious experiences. But... Um, all of the experiences collectively that I had helped, I think, fuel obviously the play that that you know you have in front of you. A play that I found immensely tricky, and in the end, I probably still look at it and feel like I never got it right. Mm. You know, if you went through my documents in my computer, and 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 if you do, I'll find it odd. But <laughs> if you were to, you would you know see probably more files for that play than any other play. Really. And I just spent more and more time writing it and rewriting it and refiguring it and in rehearsal doing, adding this and trying again for the Geffen Theater production and another version of this or that. And something nags at me still that I didn't quite land it. You know, in the end, you kind of look at it. And thankfully, it's not like when I say landing, it's not like, you know, piloting. It's more like, like, you know, diving so you know i'm still alive i'm splashing around the water but i'm looking back going yeah that was an awfully big wake i i left there i i didn't quite nail something um and i don't know what it is you know if i could think of it and get it right i would go back today i mean we're here so i probably would do it later but <laughs> um i you know it's that's one of those that's probably the one that got away in terms of plays, where I'm like, yeah, I like it. I, I I like the subject. I love certain parts of it, but the whole thing, I'm not sure I I got it right. And I, mean, I couldn't tell you why. Can Can I tell you that I, I really? Do you agree? Feel free. No, I love the play. I love the Thank play. You. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I guess a, you know compared to you, a new writer or starting off writer. And there's a project that I'm struggling with a lot. So I just want to say I find that really comforting. That someone on your level. I'm glad. No, you know, it it happens all the time. And people on, you know, you'll you'll read about Tom Stoppard and and Carol Churchill, the same thing. You know, they'll cop to it, you know, at least over coffee. They'll tell you, yeah, I fucking get, you know, not writer's block, but I I run into a a brick wall, you know, and and I, I sometimes... You know, they, these things don't, and sometimes you don't know it until you, it's, you actually have been through an entire production. And at the end of the production, you go, yeah, I don't know. Whew. Just not quite satisfied. Something, something yeah. feels like it's missing or wrong or something, and, and I don't know what it is. So, well, wait, till you, see, wait till you see these people 
Breathe. Right, figuring it out. Okay, well, wait, wait, time wait, I'm, you're gonna... I'm, all for, I'm all for someone figuring it out. Uh, may, maybe more scenes with the lawyer? <laughs> God's playing the lawyer. Spoken like a true actor. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate your insight on that. Thank My you. My pleasure. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. That's so great. So um, maybe one more question. Um, Valerie, you had a question. Uh, thanks for that, Kate and Sean. Let's see. Valerie, where are you? Raise a hi. hand. Let me see. Waving hand. Okay. Pin Valerie. Can you Two pin? hands. Hi, Valerie. Okay. That's hi, Neil. That's Valerie. Valerie, meet Neil. Neil Valerie. Valerie's a longtime student and I've directed her a bunch of shows, although not a not one of your plays at the moment, not but yet. historically. How very rude. It's rude. I'm it's fine. I'll leave right now. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. Just yeah. hear your question. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate my pleasure. it. Um, one of my questions is, is as, as you've gotten older, as we all have, um, Thank you do you me. find... <laughs> <laughs> my well, demons, I, I appreciate the, the embrace that, yes, it happens to everyone. Oh, I have to, yeah. Um, do you... Do you find that there are different themes that you're much more interested in that you had no interest in when you were younger? Um, I also write as well, and there are just mm -hmm. some things that it's really just shifted for me. And I recently was reworking a script from a long time ago, and right. I kind of wasn't interested in it at all anymore. Yeah. You found now that you're not interested in it? For that one, it was the reverse. That I, I was no longer, I couldn't relate the same way. I didn't. Yeah, I, too much time had gone past for it to have kind of the same intent I had originally intended it to. But I wondered if, you know, for you, uh, they're just new themes and stuff that you're much more interested in that you didn't have the same interest in before. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, you know, I, I get it. As I said, I, I don't really think in terms of themes all the time. It's, it's more about... I see a, a, a an interesting pair of people to write about, or you know, a, 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 some story sort of erupts onto the page. Um, I'd like to think that I'm still interested in 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 you know people and and uh, and creating interesting stories and conflict. That this so in general, no, it doesn't feel like it. But yeah, what I you know. Some of the stuff that I wrote years ago, would I write now, today, or would I write it with the same feelings, the same intensity, or the same, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I don't do a lot of looking back in that in that way. You know, for a long time, I, I never wrote a, everything was a new page. You know, I, I would finish this story, and that was, and that's the end of it. And, you know, you might have a, like a Q&A with an audience, and they're like, what do you think happens to this? And I'm like, <laughs> Fuck if I know. I don't know. How, why, how would I know that? I didn't have a thought about them beyond the close of that, that play. That's my business. The, the rest of it's, you know, if you want to believe that they, they got together in the end, great. Okay. Knock yourself out. But uh, that's not my, my business. But then, you know, at one point I wrote a, um, a sequel to something. And I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and actually think about these people again and, you know, not contradict myself and, and, and actually think about what has happened to them in a, in a viable way. Um, so that was interesting, you know, going back and, and thinking about them having aged four or five years and, and what's actually, you know, going on with them. So I've done that a couple of times now with the same group of people. Um, and that's a, that's an interesting thing, you know, to do. A great way to go back and see how you feel about about people again. You know, we do that in life. You know, we see people twenty years later. We see people three years later or a month later. Um, some we try and avoid and never see again. You know, there's there's, there's every side to that. But um, it's kind of the same with some of the characters. I mean, there are there are, there are scripts there that I have that I'd be like hard pressed to go back and write another chapter. You know, be like, oh, I don't want to go back there. I don't want you know just talked about the break of noon. I, I don't know if I would want to sit down and like crack that open again and go, okay, you said there's something wrong. Let's try and figure out what it is and, and see if you can make it right. Um, I might do it sometime or if there was a production that, you know, made me want to, uh, I saw the cat finally. Finally, it's meow. Yeah. He's black, black cat back there. Yeah. Um, for his cut yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, More general than that, or you know, a particular theme. I, you know, I, I've written, I've written a lot of things where, I mean, 
that, that things are what they seem, you know, that, that you, you present one sort of face and that, that, that there's actually something else going on or a twist of some kind that can, you know, after a while, you don't want that to be, you don't want anything to be kind of come your signature, you know, I mean, if you're Agatha Christie, maybe you go, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm afraid someone's going to have to die here, frankly, so I can, I can have another story. But if you're not writing, you know, that sort of murder mystery thing, um, you, you just, people are kind of infinitely interesting. And so I, um, some of the people that I like the most as, as storytellers, um, you know, I love this French filmmaker named Eric Romer. And uh, he made story after story after story about people who, you know, these these kind of men who, who wanted to do one thing, but, you know, sort of got their head turned over here. And, you know, just these, these romantic fallings in and outs. And, and he did it over and over, and he did it just exquisitely well. And I never got tired of watching them. And the next one's like, oh, this is going to be another one of those and I'm glad you did because you had more to say. And um, so some people will tell that story and some people never want to even come close to the same story. So it's this time it's a sci-fi and this time it's a Western and this time it's a horror. And you know, is that better or worse? I don't know. Uh, it's, you tell the stories you have. And so I um, I guess as I was about to say, I don't that often look back and go and reassess those things. I. Um, unless there was, it's a reason to. Um, occasionally, I'll crack one over. Fat Pig was it was a play that I wrote, and um, there was a point where I was there was there was going to be a production. There was a production in England. There was going to be another production on Broadway that didn't happen. And for that production, I, I started looking at the play, and I looked at it, and I, I I had this piece of paper in in one of my scripts that was. Because I don't know if you know the play, but the abruptness of the ending of it, you know, was something that people either kind of loved or they hated. It was like, oh, shit. It just, Tom just like says this thing and then that's just it. And she doesn't even get to like respond. Huh. And I was at the time like, you know, that's how life is. You know, that sometimes we just don't get to hear what the other person has to say or we walk away or whatever. And I want the audience to, you know, I don't want there to be a date and one. I want that fucker to just drop off and that's the end of the play. And, you know, feel that kind of like, not a gut punch even so much as just like, oh, yeah, I've experienced that before. You know, something just ends and you just, you have to deal with that baggage. And, um, but I was like, you know, Helen was such a, a character who kind of always said what she thought and was honest. And so I kind of wrote what Helen would say if she got a chance to talk to Tom, you know. And I kept that in my notebook there. And then at some point I'm like, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to give her that speech. Awesome. And it's not going to change that. In fact, it might make the end of the play messier because she doesn't accept what he drops on her. She says, no, you know what? I don't, I don't accept that. This is my truth. And I'm going to tell you that right now. And then we have to sit with that. Mm -hmm. So I wrote kind of a slightly different ending to the play. And, um, and then I was looking at Jeannie, the, the other female character. And I was like, you know, Jeannie has a really tough road in that play because mm -hmm. she walks in and she gets about two pages before the rug is pulled out from under her. And everything else that she does is based on the fact that she's been blindsided by this news that she finds out about who she still thinks is her boyfriend, right? And Tom is just, unfortunately, in the end, a coward and not able to just kind of be honest about who he is. Um, that's his, you know, his great fault. And it's kind of one of the saddest things to be is a coward is just really, that's a tough road to walk, you know? Um, uh, and so I was like, yeah, Jeannie, I, I, not that I felt like, oh, I've cheated her, but I, I've put her in a tough place. And so I, I said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to write another scene and I'm going to write a, I'm going to write another scene with Jeannie and Carter. And then it just kind of kept expanding. And it's like, suddenly I found a way to bring Helen into it. And I brought, and they never really meet in the play right. before that. Helen and, and, and Jeannie don't meet until the end. Um, and then Tom comes in. So it's a scene that it has all four of them in it because oh. I was looking at it and going, yeah, the play really kind of divides between when they, the people in the office don't know about Helen and when they do. 
Right. But there's four, there's three kind of scenes over here. And there's four scenes over there in the balance. Again, it was the balance for me. The kind of slightly, sadly, OCD side of me was like, I don't like that. It also came from in England. I had to put a, I had to put an interval in what we call an intermission, so okay. that they can eat fucking ice cream okay. in between your play. So I, um, I looked at that and I was like, you know, I'm going to put another play, another scene on the on the first side, so that there's four scenes where they don't know about Helen, oh. and then there's four scenes where they know about Helen, and so there's this whole other scene with those characters, but mostly it's for kind of Jeannie and Carter, and then the other two come in. And that is in the published version out of England, uh, this like collection of plays of mine, Favor put out, um, if you want to read that. Um, so but that's the kind of thing where, yeah, you go back and you have to reassess everything, or you look at what you've done. And, and uh, could I still write that same play today? You know, I hope so. I hope that I could, you know, you know, would would feel the same way as I did. And would it come out exactly the same? Probably not. I mean, if I just had the idea, if someone said, "Hey, here's this idea. What do you think?" I would probably write it differently because I'm a different person, but um, or a variation of of what I was. Um, but I think all of that is cool. You know, you 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 do what you you. It's not just write what you know. It's sometimes it's write what you don't know. But, you know, what you have a hunger for and what you at that moment want to tackle. Again, it's a little bit about making it easier on yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know why not write about those things that, that excite you and make you want to keep writing? Because it's, it's hard some nights and some days. And, you know, to keep, keep at it when, uh, when the answer is always no. This is a rejection. No, thank you. It's nobody, you know, is loving your stuff and you got to find a way. Again, that movie I mentioned, Martin Eden, is an, again about this guy just keeps getting these return to sender, return to sender. And it's just like, you know, but it just fuels him to just keep going. And um, so it was, it was a fun as a writer to watch another writer suffer in the same way that I had. You know, I used right. to carry, I used to have a, like a briefcase of, of those letters that I would just like put them in there. And, just really? them and it was like, you know, basically it was just like, you're on the list. You, I just can't wait till the day that you ask for one of my plays. Ah! And, you know, a couple of those have happened and some of them haven't happened, but you know, you, yeah. you, you find whatever it is to keep you going. You have to, you have to do that because sometimes there's nobody else to do it with you. So um, yeah. keep writing. Yeah. And, uh, that's so, keep that's, acting. that's gorgeous. You know, and you, you have been the, the human that's kept us <laughs> really, really you have really you have. And you know, by the way, I would stay here all night and have a slumber party. You guys are already in your domiciles. You're already at home. I think we're at the, the three-hour mark. I think yeah. we're, but I want to, and the bio break and the cutlets are waiting. Um, so we'll we'll complete. We'll complete in a moment. Neil, this is so brilliant. I mean, wow. So guys, you heard it all. You Thank you for teaching the class tonight. I mean, <laughs> Neil is not, this is no hyperbole. We heard tonight every day. I heard that tonight. Do you guys hear that tonight? Every day, not a day goes by. Oh my gosh, I'm hearing the wild use of imagination. Did you just slip and in a Sondheim lyric at the, at the very last moment? I How hope did I did. That? I hope I did. And uh, we're hearing that. How dare you? <laughs> How dare I? Well, um, I mean, if you're going to slip in a lyric, it might as well be him. He's, he's about as good as Being alive, days. being alive. There you go. There's Sondheim. Um, we got imagination. We got, you know, we also got, at the end of the day, guys, we have to make what we do good and entertain the troops. I mean, I really was just, what you were sharing, Neil, about like at the end of the day, like my stories that, you know, they paid their hard earned and let's, let's give them a, a night they won't forget, you know? And so. Uh, that's the job. Yeah, that's the job. Yeah. And the uh, least you can do. And it's yes. the best thing you can do as well. The least and the best you can do. So brilliant. Yes. And be good to yourselves and stay on your side, even when it seems like no one else is or will. And, um, and uh, vengeance is sweet. <laughs> Revenge is sweet. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> that, sometimes. Sometimes you be have revenge. to dig two graves, as they say, yeah. as well. So be yeah. careful. But, um, um, but so the gems today, will you come back and teach a class and I'll put 10 cents in an envelope and send it to you? I will would be happy to come back. Seconds. Or if somebody, if anybody has a question, you know, beyond this and, and wants to get in touch, please do. Um, yeah. You know, I'm uh, 
I'm your I'm your biggest cheerleader from afar. I love to be entertained, so you know I, I watch a lot more shit than I than I am able to generate. So, I uh, you're you're not competition as far as I'm concerned. You're uh, you're a chance to to hopefully see something good. Uh, I mean, if you unless you take a job from me, and then you know we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> but uh, I I only wish you well and and uh, and hope you have uh, great success with all you do and uh, and. Uh, enjoy it because you know it goes by quick it's amazing how how fast you get to to the next place where it's uh you're you're looking at a retrospective yeah. so it's um mm. you know enjoy enjoy every moment because um there's there's nothing quite like what we do yeah. um and that's i guess why we do it and that's why i think it'll never go away uh, in particular theater because you know there's there's nothing uh nothing that's quite the equivalent of it so mm. Yeah. Um, I hope it, yeah, I hope we keep doing it for a long time. Yes. Um, yes. so yeah. thanks again, guys. Have Thank a nice you. And I'm going to, I'm going to unmute them and have them say goodbye. Those of you who are in the scene study class, stay on and hang out when I end the meeting, but Neil, thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a weird virtual hug. This is what I do. It's a weird virtual hug. It's kosher because it's virtual kosher. And, um, it, and again, it may really, be indeed one of the weirdest things that I've, it's so I've seen. Weird. It's so weird. And by the way, this is cranberry juice. Cranberry no. juice, no sugar added. No I, I'm, sugar added. I'm believing that less and less as we go. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, but really, really. But thank you. thank you. God bless you. We appreciate you. We love you. And we thank God for you. You've given us the create, create, our creative dreams coming true. Every time we get to align with you and your words, your worlds, your work, it is a miracle. So thank you. Your generosity is non pareil tonight. And um Thank just you. thank you from the depths of our of our hearts. Thank you. You don't have to give a okay, weird thanks. virtual hug back. All right, so unmute everybody so they can say goodbye. Virtually unmute no chance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.